Hello everyone, welcome back to Ask a Scientist Gaming, where we combine mediocre gameplay with expert science. I'm Ken Hansen, Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry of Florida State University. I'm a photochemist slash photophysicist, which means I want to shine light on molecules and hopefully do something useful with that light energy, which means I have to understand what happens to that light energy using spectroscopic and electrochemical techniques. But more importantly, joining me today is Dr. Alex White. Alex, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Alex Wise, what all my friends call me. I'm a recent PhD graduate from Florida State University, so just graduated in May. Uh, I got my doctorate in pure mathematics from FSU's Department of Mathematics. Um, my areas of study are geometric measure theory, potential theory, and sort of their intersection, and kind of more broadly in the area of analysis. And what do you typically teach, or what did you teach? So at Florida State, I taught Pre-calculus, calculus one, calculus two, calculus three, linear algebra. Um, <laughs> and then I helped TA several of the lower level classes, like a variety of those. That's a lot of different classes. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Equally important, what game are we starting with? Um, uh, do we want to start with Melee or? Yeah, I think Melee is a good place. Okay. You got pressure on you? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Talked right. about unlocking Falco. Which uh, may, we'll we'll give it one honest go, and then <laughs> if that doesn't work, I'll just have to stick to the mirror on uh, Fox. So we'll go to the multi man, hundred man melee. <laughs> oh, All right, and then we're gonna do what every eight year old, nine year old did. We're gonna go DK. Wow. And so that was right. the, the universally known. You just do this. Dirty. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh no. no! All right. Well, let me try since that was. That was a little pathetic. I forget where the like end of the hitbox is. Oh, I see. There's a sweet spot that just speed runs this. It's, a, it's so the wireframes are so light they're just instantly KO'd by this. I think there's maybe like milestone guys. Like I think 25, 50, 75, and then the hundredth person. They're not light, so you can't just instant KO them. Yeah. Wow, so you're just using area of attack and like. Yeah. <laughs> there might be like a very small zone to the left side of that. Uh, to the left side of the stage that I might not be hitting. Um, and then if the computers get a little too scared, I do have to run over and punch them. But if they just are willing to run in like lemmings, then I'll just let them. Curious what the speed run time for this is. Yeah, I'm actually, I have no idea what the speed run for this challenge is. I mean, is. so it has all events, all target tests, classic yeah, adventure, all star, all trophies. Gotta be a, for all events. I don't know. I mean, for, specifically for the hundred man. I don't know. So there's a category extension. There we go. Okay. Unlock all characters and stages. How long do you think that takes? Unlock all characters and stages. Yep. Um. Okay. I know one of the characters Mewtwo. One way to unlock them is you have to have the game on for 24 hours. <laughs> but I'm willing to bet that the, that there's some alternative way to unlock it. Yes. So may, I would maybe put it at like two hours. So three hours and 38 minutes. Three hours, 38. Okay. That's still like mind-blowing to think about. They don't have a 100-man category. Interesting. I mean, it is just one event, so I guess that's yeah. just not interesting enough. I mean, um, the answer would be but I would, three minutes, or something like that. Well, yeah. there's there has to be a faster way. Like, there's probably some way who's someone who's figured out with RNG. Like, you can probably get it down to like a minute or so. And I apologies to the viewers if this is boring, but <laughs> this is what we did back in the day. <laughs> okay, let's go over it. And you got a goal. <laughs> yeah. I do. I want Falco. He is my I, main. So I promise my guests I will do my best to get them games, but not necessarily characters within yeah. the game. So I apologize. I know there is um, certain ROMs. I think that I think Slippy. They, it's like all pre-installed where you get everything fully unlocked, and it I think even changes the default settings for uh, matches to be whatever the standard for the meta is, which might be like five, four stock with eight minute timer. <laughs> uh oh, that might be a problem. Okay. All right. Worked out. <laughs> All right. We're down to the last 16 ish. So hopefully I don't get hit with something in the last like 30 seconds. All right. Come on. Got like 10 no of them pressure. left. 
Yeah, I'm not going to intervene yet because you're, you're focused okay. on this. You want? All right, we got seven more. Oh no! Oh no, DJ. <laughs> Where are your Just, moves? There we go. Uh oh. Mm. All right, we got it. <laughs> All right. Saved. Ugh. Let's go. Is this your final? The last five, which it might be the last five, are all like real. So you got to legit play them. Yeah, maybe. Oh, okay, no. All right, last two. All right, last one. I'm pretty sure I do have to honest fight, and I'm at 131 percent, which is not good. All right, all right. I got it. There we okay, did. Now you have to not screw up on the Falco fight. So. I don't know what's this is the unlock. Is this on Lilat? Probably. Oh no, it's not. Okay. Well, if there are any melee fans in the audience, we are currently trying to unlock Falco. That's Alex's uh, my main character of court ch choice, but Donkey Kong will have to do for. Speed oh no no it. oh no that's oh no get out of here. <laughs> uh -oh. Hence of gameplay, ladies and gentlemen. No. No! Ah. Well. Oh, so did you? I, you I, have to try that again. Yeah, you can do it again. Oh, okay. Well. Okay. <laughs> I I could have gotten there, but yeah, DK's not my main, so we'll hop over to some real matches. <laughs> no worries. And maybe we'll get lucky because I think that if you do just regular matches every now and again, you get actual characters. Oh. Okay, we'll do no items and. Uh, let's do like, but not not something too crazy. Let's do like six. All right, um, legit challenge. We'll do my favorite stage to start with, and then hopefully I can just do this in the background while I try to talk math. <laughs> All right, so Alex, you're kind of unique in one of our guests because you're our first mathematician on stream. And so, um, Alex, I think you reached out to me. You've seen the stream for years. Yes, probably, I am. At this point. Some. I don't think I was. At the very, very beginning, but early on, I actually, I think it was one of the FSU, like, online newspapers did a write-up, <laughs> yeah. and that's how I found out about it. Yeah. And so you reached out to me at some point, do you want any mathematicians? And I was like, yeah, let's have a mathematician. And you said, I tried. <laughs> no one in the math department yeah, that's wants to. <laughs> somewhat notorious that people in math, at least the, the professors are a bit shy and not willing to talk to people. Yeah, no. I asked my advisor <laughs> if it's any consolation. Yeah, and it was a just hard no he was, on that. He was just like, I don't think I'd be very good. So I, I had to show him that uh, I'll, I will hop in first. But Yeah, and so Alex, we waited until he officially got his PhD, which was a month ago. <laughs> yes. So congratulations on that. You're officially Dr. White. And your life has changed. Not much. <laughs> uh, a lot this this year. I got married in February, yeah. defended in April, graduated in May. Um, Moving tomorrow. And we're going back to uh, home to be at my sister's wedding. And then at the end of the month, we'll hopefully be fully moved out of Florida. Wow. Which, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> No, that's exciting. Congratulations, and we're excited to have a mathematician on stream. Uh, we were debating earlier, so so our stream has greatly expanded from Ask a Scientist to we have a Music theory Theorologist. Uh, this summer, we're going to have a historian, a law professor, and we have a mathematician on. And so math still falls under the STEM umbrella, and, and there's some arguments to be made of math being part of the science umbrella, but is it... Do I have to change the name to ask an academic? Um, I mean, I still like scientists, but mm -hmm. I, I get at least with like trying to advertise more broadly other areas. Maybe yeah. ask a, maybe ask a professor. Uh, ask an expert. Ask or, a. I mean, experts kind of broad because like you can be an expert in melee. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think Mango is technically an expert in melee, so we'll have yeah. to see if we can get Mango on the stream. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a good point. Professors might be like the sweet spot, but I, at least for now, I still think scientist is still mostly true. And if you're mostly true, then Good I mean, at least in math, we'd say this, your percentage of scientists are almost always uh, scientists because there's only <laughs> finitely many that weren't. Yeah, no, that's very true. 
All right. So speaking of mathematics, there, there, there's, there's, there's. Uh, so you got a pure mathematics degree. The other umbrella is, I guess, applied mathematics. That's yeah. Broadly, other. at most universities, um, generally the two largest areas, if I mean, maybe the only areas that they offer are either pure or sometimes called theoretical math, or maybe at the snooty places they'll just call it math. Uh, and then <laughs> there's the applied math. Um, here at Florida State, we call it the applied and computational math to mm -hmm. emphasize that you, the expectation is that whatever you should do should have a heavy computation focus where you're either working on uh, some novel algorithm or some improvement or some application of a recent technique to some as yet uh, unapplied problem. And so that that presumably has pretty significant overlap with data sciences, um, with scientific computing then? Uh, probably more so with the scientific computing because at least for applied math, you're not usually doing too much statistics. I mean, there are people who do stochastic stuff, but not in the same sense that like a data scientist might be doing where you're looking at like tons and tons of data and trying to do like a logistic plot against that or mm -hmm. a logarithmic kind of plot or anything like that. So uh, my wife is actually graduating from the applied math side, uh, hopefully this summer, fingers crossed. Um, she does uh, numerical simulations of supercritical carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. um, she had did a internship uh, under the NSF with uh, NREL and she was working on their supercomputer on developing a method uh, to sort of simulate the supercritical carbon dioxide, which is uh, so I'm not a material scientist, so I have to like remember all these terms. Um, <laughs> it's used for dry cleaning yeah. sometimes. <laughs> uh, it, it's a it's a weird fluid because it doesn't exactly be exhibit the behavior of a gas, but also not a liquid. So yeah. there's like interesting physics that goes it's, it's on. Bose Einstein condensate when it gets uh, cold enough. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Uh, a lot of the modeling really comes down to like attempting to figure out what the physics should be and then implementing that on like a computational scale mm -hmm. and then getting that to run on your supercomputer, which is a challenge in and of itself. Um, and my, I, you alluded to math purists. I mean, is there is there a upturned nose at applied math uh, I historically? Mean, I guess like historically, maybe yes, but I think we're, I think we're at a stage now where um, like applied mathematics is like revered enough like there's of the seven millennial problems i i know two off the top of my head are essentially applied math or computational science problems so you have in p versus np and then yeah. the navier stokes which i have no hope of ever thinking will solve the navier stokes problem I, that, <laughs> and those are just kind of the two off the top of my head, and I'm forgetting the other ones, but those are pretty hard in the computer science or applied side. So mm -hmm. I think there's enough like challenging questions within the computational side that it's it's earned its stripes. It's it's done its time in the trenches of coming up with hard and novel problems. I mean, I, the, the converse of that is like of pure math. A lot of stuff has been solved, right? Are well, people. You, I mean, yes, a lot of stuff has been solved, but also a lot of stuff uh, comes up as like new open problems or there's like large areas. So uh -huh. uh, my understanding of the area that I'm in is that there is a good amount known, but there's still like wide open, like lots of stuff that people could be doing. So um, I mean, but do the questions get smaller then and more well, focused or do they? Do you, I mean, so at um, least my understanding is that generally you you start with there's a big problem and yep. then that big problem has to be tackled in small ways. I see. So the big problems lead to small problems and the small problems is generally where stuff like a PhD defense or mm. like when you're first getting started as a postdoc or an early professor, you want to focus on the, the small problems because you have to sort of get a good lay of the land and you want to sort of develop a lot of theory and tools to sort of work towards chipping away at those big problems like mm. someone working on the twin prime conjecture like terence tau he's you know he's a big shot so to him working on these big questions is kind of like expected but for i'd say the general pure math professorate and postdoctors are 
mostly just kind of focusing on here's my area, here's some open questions that we kind of know, or here's some questions that we have some ideas but nothing solid yet, mm -hmm. and you're generally just kind of working and plugging away at that. Um, which I guess I can sort of go into my area, which... Um, well, before diving into that, let's let's start at the beginning, and, yeah. and then when we go with pretty much every stream, we start with you know what was the path that led you where you are today, and what were the key moments that it's like this is the direction I'm going, and it's obvious in retrospect. Yeah. So, I guess if if there's any good news to anyone who's either an undergraduate right now or about to start grad school, is that I had a very much non-linear path to where I am right now. Um, so. I think maybe this thing that's sort of obvious is that I was sort of always good at math uh, to some degree. I, math was always my strongest subject, certainly. Um, but at least when I went off to college, I had no idea I was going to be a mathematician. I initially, funnily enough, thought I wanted to be a pharmacist. Mm. Um, so I went to Mercer University because they have a pre-pharmacy track and they have a pharmacy school in Atlanta. Wait, why did you think you wanted to be a pharmacist? Um, I played Resident Evil. <laughs> if I have to be honest, I yeah. thought that, oh, maybe pharmacy or pharmacological research would be cool. Yeah. Uh, and that was basically the entire brunt of my decision. Initially. Yeah, you fell for the lore. And... <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, not to throw shade at you, but uh, chemistry kind of I, I didn't dislike chemistry, but I was kind of like, I'm not enthusiastic about chemistry. Yeah. And maybe that was sort of the first sign of like, I probably shouldn't do something that relies a lot on chemistry if I'm not, you know, crazy about learning a lot more chemistry. Yeah. Um, and then I did a short job shadowing. Like one day I saw a pharmacist and I was just like, yeah, this is not exciting enough. Maybe I need to find something else that like really yeah. piques my interest. But funnily enough, uh, to do the pre-farm track at Mercer, you did not have to declare a major. And so my mom, suppose, yeah. my mom convinced me, he's like, well, you're good at math, so just major in math. And then, you know, you can minor in chemistry as you finish the pharmacy track. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, I majored in math at the time and I didn't have really anything else that I was sort of majorly interested in. So at the time I was like, well, I'll just stick with the math for now. And see where that goes. And then as I got past the calculus sequence, which is, I think we're probably most college students kind of, they get through calculus. Maybe if you're a computer scientist or an engineer, you take linear algebra and then you drop off. As I got into the, the real math classes, as I say, where I was doing proofs, mm -hmm. that was kind of where I really discovered what math kind of is. And yeah. that was sort of what enticed me. It was like, whoa, this is really interesting and really challenging. And there's a lot that I don't know and I want to know so much more. So that was sort of like the key intuition that like I should definitely continue to do math. And as I got towards the end of my bachelor's, I got the opportunity to do like a small research project uh, where funnily enough, I was studying music theory with math. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a really interesting book by uh, this professor um, I think at the time, maybe he was at Yale or uh, misremembering, uh, Dimitri Tomasco. And apologies for the Eastern European name. But, uh, it starts with a T. Tomasco. It's like T M Y O. <laughs> yeah. Uh, What's the book? The book is The Geometry of Music. And that should immediately pop it up. Oh, that's fun. So that's a mathematical analysis yes. of oh, Princeton, Princeton okay. University. Yes, so he's a music theorist over at Princeton, but he sort of collected a bunch of these ideas about looking at music theory through this lens of a sort of mathematical uh, rigor or maybe a mathematical perspective and sort of relating it to these math objects that are fairly well known in the math world. And reading that sort of like opened my eyes to like what research could be. Um, so I did like a short, like undergraduate kind of paper and presentation, and that sort of had me hook, line, and sinker for math. Hmm. So from there, I went back home and lived with my parents for two years while I did a master's, and then from there, I left from UAB or graduated from UAB, and then came here to Florida State. 
All right, so grad school in mathematics, what, what does that look like? So you take a certain number of classes, UTA, you also research. Yes, so um, I would say this is maybe not universally true, but probably like 95% true with US uh, universities. Uh, it's a bit different in Europe, but mm -hmm. in U most US universities, when you arrive as a freshly minted bachelor's, you kind of know very, very, very little about math. As e <laughs> even though you've taken these really difficult, challenging math courses, um, the first year of grad school is, I, would, I have to say, like, I've yet to meet an individual to say that their first year of grad school math was the hard, was not the hardest. I think it's pretty <laughs> universal that it's always a challenge to not just get adjusted to grad school in general, but like the level of difficulty in general just kind of explodes. Uh, so you spend either one or two years at FSU, you spend basically two years doing the standard core courses. So at least at FSU that comprises of real analysis, which really should be called measure theory. Um, then you take usually an algebra sequence where you learn, uh, we do group theory, uh, ring theory, field theory, a, a bit of module theory, and then we also try to cover some category theory um, just as like a an intro to the algebra stuff because we have a few category theorists on staff. Uh, and then we also have a topology sequence where we cover point set topology but also some algebraic topology before you're kind of let loose into the higher level stuff so and that's two classes a semester or what does that come that's to? three classes a semester so my first year i took uh we were on a different sequence at the time i took complex analysis topology one algebra one and then uh, second semester i took real analysis which was the first semester of measure theory algebra two topology two mm -hmm. and then you take uh or we, we've since changed the policy, but I took three qualifying course or qualifying exams, which for us are all paper exams, mm. which I, I guess I've found out through your streams is a bit different than a lot of the other programs. Mm -hmm. So for us, you aren't even doing a single presentation until you get past the qualifying exams. Oh wow! Uh, and they, those are kind of the the big filter. Um, one of the older grad students told me as I was getting prepared, he said, yeah, once you get past the qualifying exams, you basically have the PhD. Um, What's the success rate on those? Uh, okay, so from my year, the we started with, I think, nine pure math. Um, we had uh, two leave for various reasons before the end of the first year. Mm -hmm. um, one who did not pass the qualifying exam Another one left uh, uh, basically because of COVID. They, I, I think, left and got a job. Mm -hmm. um, someone transferred to UGA, which is honestly a much better program than FSU. And they are like the only program that does exactly what he wanted to do. So good Makes for him. Sense. Yeah. Um, I said one, two, three, four. Uh, there's a couple more. <laughs> no worries, you don't need exact numbers. I, I mean, how so, many okay, made it so in our So of the initial nine, three of us have graduated. Myself and then uh, my academic twin brother, we graduated with the same... Uh, we basically used the same paper as the foundation of our defenses. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the other guy who started in our cohort, um, who defended, I think, last month, actually. I think about a, oh. just about a month ago. Yeah, so we have a 33 percentage success rate from starting all the way to to the end. To the end. But only one was filtered at the qual step. Yeah. So you but, guys take it seriously, or yeah, they leave first. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's it's just take it seriously. It is difficult, and mm -hmm. I think that is also maybe the first filter where you kind of learn like what are your priorities because if you kind of realize that you don't want to stick around, then that's kind of a good sign of like just take the masters and honestly get a job because uh you're not really like gaining too much aside after trying to stick around and like maybe try to push to the end and then decide to fizzle out towards the end yeah so it's kind of a, a make or break moment and i think it's generally a good decision of if you're like i don't want to do this anymore yeah 
That's get the advantage. masters and then move on. That's fair. So you get a coursework masters then, and you, you yeah, and then after two years, yeah, and then um, after you get the the uh, you do the uh, the qualifying exams. We have, which I think is probably translates to your qualifying exams, what's called the advanced topic exam, mm. which is traditionally a presentation. So. For me, my advisor gave me like a seminal paper in the area and said, all right, read this and in two months, uh, give a talk on it. That's fine. So I had to like catch up to the background knowledge because, you know, I read this paper for the first time. I had no idea what was what was going on initially. I There was yeah. all these symbols. That's the problem with math is that when you pick up a paper you're not familiar with in the area, there's just like symbols and variables everywhere. And you're like, I have no idea what any of this means. <laughs> so I, I think I honestly spent like two or three weeks just figuring out all the variable names and what yeah. the quantities are representing. Because even though they like list it like pretty like on the second or third page, they say like this quantity is represented by this. You know what does that mean? What does that even mean? So I had to like sit. I went to Paper Fox, I think, when that was still over um, on West Ten West Pensacola Street, uh -huh. and I just like sat in there for like two weeks and just was reading this paper and trying to figure out what was going on. Huh. Um, and you're saying the variables aren't universal across an area? Uh, sometimes they are. Sometimes they aren't. There's like a very wide problem of like letters and to a lesser degree variables are not universal and consistent mm -hmm. so to give an example we have something called a covering radius so i think in our paper and what i ended up doing in the dissertation we used the greek row mm -hmm. lowercase row but in the paper that i was reading they use lowercase r Mm. So like maybe they'll do that where they'll switch R with Rho yeah. or they'll do something else where they'll switch like a Greek or the Latinized alphabet around. But I mean, I've had examples where like it's, they call something completely different. And like there's an ongoing joke in math that if you don't know what to call something, call it normal. Because there's I honestly think about 26 or 20 or so different things that are called the normal thing there's the normal <laughs> subgroup That's awesome. there's a normal subspace yeah. and it's like the the definitions are not equivalent or if they are i don't understand oh, that the i'm going to check on a kid quick so oh, sorry about all right that. i will attempt to not get owned by peach in the box peach matchup i'll also try to read chat which is over there Never know when your kid is going to need help on the toilet. So, <laughs> sorry for the intermission there. All right, so we had the the qualifying exam and then the presentation on a paper, and, and then, then basically after the ATE, you're kind of let loose. You can you can do whatever. I at that point, you're essentially doing all research all the time. We do have a minor requirement, which is that before you graduate, you have to attend two semesters worth of colloquium. Uh, I don't know if it's the same in chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're expected to do that at some point. It can be before or after the ATE. But there is also like a, I, I don't know if it's an unspoken rule, but there's an expectation that you will at least attend one seminar per semester or maybe one, one per year. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, so for us, it's it's they have to go every week, pretty much. So. Well, so like you'll you'll sign up for a seminar course, and then that seminar course will run one one day a week. I um, see. I for see. Maybe like an hour, an hour and a half. Okay. Um, so, thankfully, once my advisor arrived, we were able to get an analysis seminar, which basically turned into a research seminar. So nice. We were doing research for uh, on campus for one hour a week. Uh -huh. um, Although I, there were some times where I did have to sign up for either the topology seminar or the algebra seminar. And yeah, that was a challenge to try and keep up with what was going on. Because I'm <laughs> not an algebraist in any sense. No worries. It's good for broadening your horizon. 
That All is right. sort of interesting. So a seminar, you're doing research, you write a thesis, you defend your thesis. Cradle grave, what's the average time to PhD in mathematics? Uh, at Florida State, it's, I think for pure math, the average is maybe six years. Uh, financial math, which is another one of our areas, is a little bit faster. Uh, partly, I guess, because it's a little bit quicker to get off the ground and start doing stuff. Because, you know, you can take a established theory and apply it to, like, one specific instance of some financial pattern or model that you want to specifically test. Yeah. Um, applied math is kind of in between where it can be five or six. Um, and then biomath is the fourth area we have, and that is probably also like in the five to six year range. Okay. So it's advertised five years, but uh, don't be surprised <laughs> if it takes six. It's false advertising, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, yeah, chemistry, we're 5.2 years, but it depends on your area, obviously. It averages out. And I guess part of that is also just like, there is so much math to catch up on. Like the first two years, I really don't see how you could compress it unless you already have a master's degree. Yeah. So at, at that point, you've already spent two years somewhere else. Um, unfortunately, I was unlucky and had to redo my master's more or less because the master's at UAB was a bit different. We did not have a full algebra sequence. I um, so I kind of had half the credits and then I forgot a lot of the details of complex analysis, so I had to retake the class, but it worked out because I was able, we have a exemption policy where if you get A's in both semesters, you don't have to take that qualifying exam in the, oh, wow. in the pure math side. So I was able to get A's in my analysis and topology sequence, so I only had to take one exam. All right, we're a half hour in, we should do a prediction. So start with this one, the top of the- uh, Yes, let's we'll start with the top one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ask a Scientist Gaming. If you're joining us for the first time or our first few times, uh, yeah, mediocre gameplay expert science. Today, our guest is Dr. Alex White. He's a mathematician who studies uh, geometry. Is that the uh, easiest? I think if you wanted to shorten it, you could say fractals. Fractals, that's fair. That's that's a really fun way to describe it. But yeah, if you guys have any questions about, uh, we'll say fractals and related things or math education, Alex is very interested in that. If you have any questions at all, throw them in chat, but also so we have questions for you. So on Ask a Scientist Gaming, we use our predictions not for predicting outcomes in games, at least not usually. Instead, we like to share the expertise of our particular guests, and we do it in the form of questions. And tonight we have a theme actually behind all of our questions. And there, the theme is gonna be which came first, some relatively well-known historical event or uh, some mathematical innovation. And so, if you guys aren't following, click the follow button. One, because it helps the visibility of our channel and gets our numbers up. We just crossed 600 followers, which is not a huge number, but also this is our 60th stream. So we average 10 followers per stream, which is pretty remarkable. Um, but yeah, those numbers help us. So click the follow button, but also you get 300 standard energy units that you get to gamble, or you can spend them on making us drink alcohol. You can request a factoid, or you can also bet as confident as you are on any given prediction that we put up on the screen. And so at the top of your chat, you'll see a predict button click that button and you're going to make a decision on which came first the symbol for zero or the great sphinx which was approximately 24 2500 bce and so and we'll give a hint the symbol for zero is the ancient egyptian symbol for zero <laughs> you're giving it, it away from the same civilization <laughs> so i still don't think that that's going to be too much of a hint yeah We'll see. So yeah, if, if you guys are, I, and uh, note that you are on Ask a Scientist Gaming Honor Code, so you cannot look up the answer, just guess or predict based on what you know. Um, uh, kind of a fun idea, which 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 came first, the Great Sphinx or the symbol for zero? Which, which major contribution to human development came first? So yeah, put your predictions in there now. You guys have about a minute and 30 seconds left. So yeah, it'll be the theme for the night, which came first? Um, which is fun, not something we necessarily contextualize. One, because we're not particularly good at history, and two, we don't know where our mathematics come from, so yeah, it'll and be interesting. This was also in part like I was really curious about like when a lot of these things that we think about a lot, like how old are they? Yeah. And I also tried to think about it like, so, so there's some events, there's some people, and it's interesting to think about this person was alive at a time when this thing was either not in like not used yet or not known yet or is like recent so i tried to tie all these pretty close together all right you guys have about 
20 seconds left. Which one came first, the Zero or the Great Sphinx? Put your predictions in there. Click the Predict button. Uh, again, it's mostly pride on the line because these standard internet units are useless outside of this channel. But if you guys are interested, put your prediction one way or another. Um, which one came first, the Symbol for Zero or the Great Sphinx? This is not Lucas. I'm so used to Brawl. All right, so we've closed out. It's a 50-50 split. Alex, what is the correct answer? The Great Sphinx. So, so we built a monster before we had a symbol for zero. So the the symbol for zero, which is I also traced to the old kingdom of Egypt, I believe, uh, was from, I think you have it up here, 1770 BCE. So they, they did have a symbol, which I was surprised because I thought it was going to be sort of ancient uh, in this route, in this valley. Mm. So I did not know that as of right now, we believe that Egypt was the first to come up with that. So, so it was interesting. So I, I look up a lot of these questions just because I'm genuinely curious. And they talked about like in, in Babylon, like they had, you know, positive numbers and negative numbers and they had a blank space in between. Yeah. But there was like no symbol there. There was no yeah, independent so, denotion. So there, there's sort of like an interesting history to this because like, you can conceptually, at least like to me, I'm thinking, all right, if you're trying to develop some sort of economy, if the, you, for a lack of better term, where you want to keep track of things and you want to have like a tabular record of something, you'd say, okay, so <laughs> you gotta start I, somewhere, right? <laughs> I have a positive number of bushels of wheat, and uh, Tim down the street owes me three, so that's you know what you could conceive of as negative. Yeah. Well, then what happens when he pays that debt? Well, they consider it blank. They don't think of that as like a, a yeah. numerical value, which is kind of interesting to think. And it took a while for all these ancient civilization to like get over that need for there to be. It's either positive or negative uh, there, that there's there's a special character uniquely for zero. Yeah, you know, there was something else about Mesoamerica. They also had a zero of some kind. I guess Tanya yeah. Paris would have been the one to ask, a historian in that area. But. Yes, I unfortunately am not super familiar with the mathematics of Mesoamerica, but yeah. the, I, from what little I do know, it does seem very interesting, the the number systems that they were able to develop and the, yeah. the methods of recording that. Well, and they were also starting to map stars and whatnot. So yeah, they, they, they tightly correlated. It's really fun. I'm getting my butt kicked. Yes. But yeah, if anyone has questions for Alex, uh, he's happy to talk about them, happy to answer, uh, discuss fractals. Um, pretty good at algebra at this point, I'm guessing. Uh, I'd say good enough. <laughs> I was good enough to fool the grading committee. <laughs> we'll, we'll count that as being good. Which, uh, it is sort of funny because, like, when a mathematician talks about algebra and then when someone who's not a mathematician talks about algebra, we're talking about very different things. Yeah. So, um... You, I think you know at least a little bit about group theory yep. from, I guess, its applications to crystal structures. But yeah, um, I teach group theory class yeah. actually. Which I'm <laughs> interested to know, like, what exactly you cover. Oh, it's group. it's very superficial in terms of how we cover group theory, but more of like how it's applied mostly. Because from what little I do know, and I guess this is the problem with math, math is that there's not a like widely accepted need or belief that in the need of a history of math course. Hmm. So this does kind of get to be a problem where you get to like 20th century math where like, I don't know the background of my area or I didn't until I had to like ask my advisor. I was like, okay, so is this known? Like, did people know about this? Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh yeah, people thought about this and they thought that it was hard. So they stopped. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so there's this like problem of like the transfer of knowledge kind of, I guess, a little bit more difficult because yeah we have online tools now but uh like if you want to learn about like a specific thing how do you know what to call it like because the the people in that area will develop their own names for things so mm -hmm. finding out what you want to know kind of becomes an endeavor in and of itself of trying to find 
what exactly it is you're trying to describe. So, <laughs> yeah, no, and then one of the things I cover in my group theory class is chemists did not invent group theory. We're using a thousand year old mathematics, <laughs> like so, like origins of. A thousand I mean, years. like, but the, in, the application is sort of readily apparent because the the first group theorists did not call it group theory. They were interested in understanding symmetries. So, yeah. you give me some object or some structure, so like a crystalline structure, definitely would be of interest to them and you say okay so if you rotate this around when does it look the same so like a square if i rotate it you know like this how it, how many degrees do i have to rotate it before it looks the same mm -hmm. so it can be 90 it yep. can be 180 270 or 360. Yep. or you can think about like flip actions so like there's a rotation action and then there's a flipping action where you like flip it from back to front so they were interested in understanding this and then it kind of took a long time for them to sort of get this all into one cohesive like theory and i have no idea why they called it group theory like that's another problem is like why groups like what is it that about the word group that fascinated them to call it all group theory wasn't it i mean it, it's basically anything that falls within these four rules yeah but, it's defined so, as a group yeah right? so there, I, there's also like this joke of like a group is a set that follows the group laws <laughs> and then i a lot of physicists and uh, engineers lament that depending on what linear algebra textbook you get uh it will define a vector space is a space that contains vectors and mm -hmm. follows the vector laws. It's yeah. like, okay, that doesn't tell me anything. All that says is that this thing is named after the things that it contains. Yeah. But uh, like a self-referencing yeah, nomenclature. Yeah, so you yeah. kind of have to like, I think at least with like vector spaces, it does make sense to sort of think about like an application first approach where you think, okay, so let's sort of naively think that a vector is just an arrow in space with an associated magnitude. So that can be a force vector where you have some force that's being applied in a direction and you record the direction and the magnitude as two things that combine together into a single object. And then you say, okay, let's collect all objects and turn that into an overarching space and consider what the properties of that space should be. So if force magnitudes can be added together, then there should be some sort of additive law for vectors. So a lot of it comes from sort of common sense where it's like, yeah. it feels like this should be true. Just necessity, yeah. yeah. So it's like, it would be weird if this weren't not <laughs> true. So that's where a lot of the like basic laws of these vector spaces and group spaces sort of come from where there was like specific canonical examples first and then the theory developed later and then the theory kind of evolved to such a state that it's like uh, agnostic of all examples. So a group can be defined by these laws uh, without any reference to a specific group object or other mathematical framework aside from just like the logic uh, side of it. So it is kind of a problem, but if you kind of get over it, uh, you can... I feel you can uh, definitely learn to appreciate the math if you're just willing to just take it on face value that, yeah, a lot of things are named dumb, but <laughs> if you get over it, then you can understand like why it makes sense. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. All right, we're 45 minutes. If at any point you want to change games, let's do it. That's not to entice you to change games, just to, like make you aware of the timeline because time flies while you're video okay. gaming and talking and and hanging out and drinking alcohol. Speaking of which, our drink of choice tonight is, there it is, Bro Brothers Theolonius Belgian Style Abbey Ale. So this uh, is a beer made by North Coast. Uh, they're out in California. And for a time, I don't know if this is still true, uh, part of the funds from all beer cells go towards supporting the uh, Thelonious Jazz Institute, which I think is maybe oh, wow. in Utah. So it, it partially funds, uh, I think, scholarships uh, or other just you know basic budgetary needs of the Jazz that. Institute. And uh, yeah, I'm a huge jazz head as well. So if 
If anyone in chat wants jazz record recommendations, I will answer that as well. <laughs> we'll add that to your list of expertise, yes. but I, I, no, that's really cool. We're, we're, we're supporting jazz yes. music and music scholarships via drinking alcohol. Note to everyone, this is a 9.4% alcohol Yeah, this is content. a... It's, it's a bit. Um, like at some point, it's no longer beer, and I think it's approaching that. <laughs> yeah, so some people like their hoppy IPAs. I do not. I like dark beers like this, mm. or beers with a fairly high alcohol content that are malty, and this checks all my boxes. Yeah, 9.4 might be a record for a beer on our street. I know it's I definitely Stag. did not want to do... They also make another one called the... Uh, it's... It's named after the Rasputin, I think Old Rasputin, and that's I think like eleven point something, and that'll put some hair on your chest. But I'll, I'll keep an eye out. That, that's a very special occasion beer, and a one you drink one and you're you're good for the night. Yeah, I was gonna say we got we got four of these in in the cooler, but, yeah, so, but it is nice that it's only a four pack and not a six pack. So. Yeah. <laughs> burn the bridge down. Well, I'm feeling it. I'm, I'm almost one in, actually. So <laughs> we're... I'm trying to sip just because I, I know I have to answer. And no, I that's don't know if I can talk coherent math. I mean, deep this is just an excuse for me to drink, so it works out perfectly. <laughs> so I appreciate it. All right. If you guys have math questions, Alex is happy to answer them or jazz related questions. I mean, speaking of which, going back to the geometry of music, I mean, that's an intriguing idea because it is it is a mathematical you know, formula to some degree. Like there are beats, there are patterns, there are... Yeah, so you can, I think specifically, at least for me, um, what's interesting is when you look at like harmony. So when you play multiple notes together and I, I'm holding up my hand because I'm a piano player um, yeah. or partly piano player. Uh, when you're playing multiple notes, you can look at like the structure of how those notes are arranged in terms of like the distances between them. Yeah. And there's like an interesting way that you can think about plotting that uh, as a Merbius band, I hope I'm pronouncing that right because it's German. Uh, Merbius strip, which oh, is Mobius strip. I, I know or it's it looks Mobius, but the the O has a, the umlaut, so I think it's. Mo I think the O with the umlaut is pronounced Merbius. Uh, is it? That's interesting. We'll we'll have to see. Um, huh. But it's a one-sided figure, so if you. If you have a Merbius band and you take a colored pencil or a marker and you start coloring one side and you drag it all the way around, you'll eventually cover what looks like both sides of the strip and then come back to where you started. So you can entirely cover it or paint it with one color, even though it looks like it's two sided. Uh, so you can sort of do the same thing where you have a Merbius band and you sort of plot the relative uh, distances between certain notes and sort of look at the harmony structures on that. Which is kind of interesting to think that there's like a way to embed a musical structure inside of a math object. I mean, so this is interesting. This might be the difference between uh, British and English pronunciation, or British and US pronunciation. Mervius. 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 Okay. And then are we the Mobius? Okay, so we say Mobius. it wrong. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so the American pronunciation Mobius. is Mobius. The UK Mobius. is Merbius. My <laughs> wife is part Hungarian from her mom's side, so every time a, a Hungarian mathematician comes up, she has to correct my pronunciation. <laughs> no Which worries. Is, I think Erdos is probably the most famous example. It looks, it looks like Erdos, but I, 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 she's going to kill me when I get home, but I believe it's Erdos. I mean, it's interesting. Sorry, I was looking at Morbius during your, uh, your your description of that, but you're talking about it in terms of ge geometric sense of com uh, like space between notes and things like that. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, the the other mathematical interpretation is that it's it's a sum of sine waves, right? Like you can yeah, FOIA so transform. If you wanted to look at it purely in terms of like a frequency, you can yeah. like decompose it into sine waves and look at like the ratio of the amplitudes, or mm -hmm. maybe not the amplitudes, the, the frequencies. Frequency. Yep. Um, and you can get in some interesting developments elements out of that because that's how the original Greeks sort of developed and maybe you can say like birthed Western harmony yeah. by looking at sort of certain fractal or fractional ratios between those frequencies. So if you take a piece of string and you vibrate it and then you cut it in half and vibrate it again, that will be one octave up because mm -hmm. you've shortened it by a factor of two. And if you elongate it by a factor of two, you go down by an octave. And then a lot of the really consonant uh, harm harmonies like a perfect fifth perfect fourth those are pretty well uh, um, 
like well simplified fractions so like three to two or two to three and then four to three and three to four and then the really dissonant notes are like complicated fractions if you will so like 15 over 16 or if you go the other direction it'd be 16 over 15. i mean so presumably the layout of piano is like a manifestation of those relationships <laughs> yeah right? and like and it, it just kind of emerged from that yeah and so there is sort of this interesting idea where like if you play not just like two but say like four notes simultaneously mm -hmm. so you're thinking okay how many connections are there well there's what four choose two maybe yeah. one two three four five six so yeah four choose two so there's six relationships between the four notes so then that's six different things that you can sort of combine together so like if i move one note that changes all six or that changes what three of the six connections mm -hmm. so you can like do a lot of like manipulating these relationships around and sort of analyzing like what sort of chords like four note chords come up with certain relationships versus others and yeah. i think i kind of got really into it because when you start studying jazz a lot there's a lot of music theory that's sort of like a necessary background to understand uh -huh. and it just like kept coming up where like the development of like the chord melody the chordal melodies is like hinging on these relationships and like how you resolve certain notes like you'll take one chord you'll move one note down a half step mm -hmm. that's your next chord and then you'll move one up a half step or something like that so you're like doing very small changes progressively over time to get this overall melody i mean so how digestible is this geometry of music is that, a, uh, is that I, math targeted or i heavily recommend it i say if you have a either small math background or a small music background, I think it's digestible. So it, it can be one or the other, or if you have both, that's great too. Well, let's put this on a scalar. What does small math background mean to uh, you? So if you're familiar with fractions, graphing things, um, and then if you're willing to Google a couple of math objects, then, <laughs> then you're good. Like if you, if you Google Merbius band and you can read the wiki and understand that, then it's approachable. Huh. I think uh, Dimitri did a really good job on the book. I highly recommend it. Oh, that's awesome. If you guys are curious, check it out. Uh, the link is up in the chat there. The the geometry of music. Take a look at it. I mean, that's just, it's 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 very curious because, I mean. And it's it's at, not a like textbook in like a, a proper sense. It is kind of like almost a novel where it's like written to be read. Like you sit down and read it and think about the ideas he brings up. It's not something that you have to sit down and study and like bust out a pen and paper and like work through what he's saying i mean music is one of those things like i'm really glad we had julian grasso on stream because she's like a music theorist but it's it's one of those like we can intuit when something doesn't make sense in music yeah we and can't that's, necessarily that's formalize sort of like the interesting thing is like okay if you want to approach this with a math like perspective then it should be coherent with the way that we interpret music mm -hmm. and to some degree that is doable where you can sort of define in a way something that sounds good to be pleasant you can say like all right let's define this to be good and then something that sounds bad to be bad mm -hmm. and then analyze like what are the results that you get from that choice yeah no i love it because it it, it it bridges material science plus biomechanics plus neurobiology plus mathematics and physics and like uh, there's something just so elegant about something we take for granted and don't necessarily have to understand to appreciate. So yeah, no, that's really fun. So yeah, check out Geometry of Music if you guys are interested. I'll suggest that to my brother. He's he's very musically inclined, but also a, a computer engineer. <laughs> so it seems like some things go hand in hand. All right, we're almost an hour into the stream. Um, yeah, anyone just joining us? Ask a Scientist Gaming, Mediocre Gameplay, Expert Science, where our guest today is Dr. Alex White playing uh, some Melee for the GameCube, actually. Um, this is our first, uh, I think our first use of the GameCube, actually. We played the NARC, um, the NARC Arcade version is actually on the GameCube. <laughs> so if you want to revisit that, but I picked up a, a, a GameCube controller specifically for the stream, so. Where now, we're slowly no Johns, learning. but this is not a GameCube controller. This is a Switch <laughs> GameCube controller. It is. <laughs> and I'm not used to the Switch GameCube controller. I, so what's the difference? Uh, well, mostly it's just this center face is kind of like messing. And it, it, I think there's no vibrator. Like, oh, no, there isn't. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever they're called, uh, which kind of is throwing me off in the weight. But 
No Johns, no Johns. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. We, we did our best. I figured it out, what, a week ago we decided on the game, and I, yeah. <laughs> Amazon came through this weekend, so uh, we appreciate that. But yeah, if you guys have questions for Alex, throw them in chat. If not, we're going to go to one of our favorite defaults. Um, which one do you think is coming? Um, default. Uh, default cool. questions. Yep. Um, well, we've already done background, yep. so... That's the easy one. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing uh, experiments, and like experiments that have gone wrong. <laughs> we could do that. Um, I, th I think the easy one for you, because you don't necessarily do experiments yeah. in the traditional sense. I'll say the I'll... experiments question would be rather boring. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's fair. I mean, the unlimited budget one, we'll get back to that one, but the other one is movies, TV shows, that get oh, your expertise okay. right I and wrong. I did try to prepare for this, actually, so over did the you? weekend I watched two <laughs> You watched movies? <laughs> so I had never seen uh, Good Will Hunting oh, wow! this weekend, and I knew I was like, I have to watch this eventually. Yeah, it's one of my favorite movies, actually. And it is a really good movie. It is not a good math movie, <laughs> but that's because it's more of a therapy movie. Yeah, you yeah. Get what I'm saying? Yeah, it's not but, for the math. But, uh, I mean, it's kind of like well known. I think there's like a, a YouTube video of like mathematician reviews math in movies. And yeah. I think the math is like fairly on point to give. I mean, because, you know, general audience has no idea what research level math looks like, especially at Harvard. So yeah. I think it gives enough of an impression of like, what we kind of are doing uh -huh. that it's it's convincingly sells the illusion mm -hmm. um i have more of an issue with kind of like the lifestyle and like everything else about like what's going on like will in the movie is like no math person i've ever seen where he just figures things just out like it. that yeah, He's yeah just like oh yeah i sat down and in two minutes i knew what the answer was which is absolutely not the case yeah. Uh, that's probably like the, the most far-fetched thing, at least in my opinion. I mean, but there are unique, uh, like uh, Ramachandran, right? Yeah, I mean, like Ramanujan is like, Ramanujan, yeah, is there kind we go. of like, the like the, the upper yeah. upper mo and i would if you want to know what ramanujan is like just watch the ramanujan movies there's, yeah. there's i think two of them now out so um, that kind of gives you a better idea of like what we were dealing with in the early 1900s what is it? it was the man who knew infinity yeah there's the man who knew infinity and i think there was one that was maybe made in india that i think is named after i think it's whatever his first name is which i i do not remember and then it's like his first name and then ramanujan uh, which maybe does a little bit better of portraying sort of his life outside of math. But from what I've heard, I have not watched Man Who Knew Infinity, that it's supposedly pretty good. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 and I don't know how true this is, but the way they convey it in the movie, sorry for spoilers on this, but it's, it's like he just in to it everything yeah, like I, he and he the, the fight was that he wasn't in the formalized framework of proofs. Yeah. So to say he is are mozart yeah like mozart it, it, everyone kind of knows like from an early early age he just understood music on a level no one else did he revolutionized uh classical music at the time qualifier his sister also uh, yeah. did his, his sister <laughs> is also like crazy good yeah. and he came from a musical family but like to some extent you could argue that like there was something more going on with Mozart. Yeah. To maybe even a higher degree, Ramanujan is like more impressive because he was in India. I think he found a textbook, yep. taught himself all of the math by himself. Then he figured out all these formulas and just like knew them and then sent a letter to Hardy, G.H. Hardy, who's like, you know, a huge, like Titanic figure. He's maths Einstein. He sends him this letter and says, I think these are right. And Hardy says, you need to come to England to talk to me. <laughs> yeah. And he, yeah, and a he lot was, of proofs, but he died at 31 or something yeah, like that. It was so really he, young. Right? He actually had a lot more like unproven stuff. So mm. he just had this notebook of formulas that he like filled up and he didn't formally prove them. And we're to this day still going through this notebook proving like going back and like doing the cleanup work of proving the formulas and i think i, I haven't followed it too closely because he's not in my field uh but as far as i know like every formula has been right really he, he's yeah, it, never so he died at 32 years old and it was yeah. like a pneumonia or something it was a yeah. long 
related. But yeah, tragic loss. I can't imagine what he would have done between him and like um, Alan Turing. Like, oh, how much brain power did he lose? It's kind of like an ongoing theme with math where we have like a lot of these brilliant rising stars and then they pass away at a like a somberly young age. So there's Ramanujan. There was um. Miriam, I forgot her last name. She was the first uh, woman to win the Fields Medal. She passed away, I think, from cancer a couple years ago. Um, and there's kind of like an ongoing like epidemic of like mental illness among mathematicians, which is, it's like weirdly prevalent. Uh, not like, you know, not something crazy like 80%, but it's mm -hmm. like, it's a bit higher than the general population. Yeah, yeah. Like, like it's sort of like raises some eyebrows. Like, why does this keep happening? Uh, so it's very unfortunate that this ke keeps happening, but it's sort of the same story with a lot of jazz musicians that I've learned. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> All right, keep playing this or switch to uh, something else. We'll switch to something else. Now. What do you What do you want to go with? I think if I'm going to start answering the hard hitting questions, we will go to Fire Emblem. <laughs> there's there's, there's no hard hitting questions on this stream. <laughs> if I have to start explaining my uh, research, then I that that might <laughs> take more brain power. That's fair. All right. Oh, we're on a weird backdrop. All right, Fire Emblem. So we're going to Game Boy Advance that we're playing on BizHawk with a Super Nintendo controller. <laughs> I'm going to say something controversial. I'm I'm playing the best GBA Fire Emblem. Fight me if you think <laughs> otherwise. This is the best one. Yeah. Stay mad forever. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> unfollow us it's fine <laughs> there's there's a very sizable like the pr the pro fire emblem community is like pretty like universally thinks this one's bad because you can grind in it i see so you can like get your characters see. arbitrarily as strong as you want uh but i like the story so uh sure. let's see. I think we, we were on, states? Yes, yeah we're there we here. go so we're here on the uh, chapter we're one. skipping we we skipped all the intro sorry if you guys are missing the lore but also it doesn't really matter we're here to talk expertise in science all right so goodwill hunting it had some what did it add? it had like branch theory or uh, it was a uh, combinatorial graph theory yeah and they they put some graphs up i was watching i was paying attention so that was that was the legit. math was like kind of good, but the the people in it were a bit over exaggerated. Um, <laughs> in terms of the yeah, like how profound of, it like, was, the the professor being like, "I wish you would just go take this job that I got for you." It was like I I don't think a math grad would ever be like, "Oh, you got me a job. I don't want that." Yeah. <laughs> um, but the other one that I watched this weekend was, and I. I got to give my love and respect to Darren Aronofsky, but Pi is not <laughs> accurate. Um, Pi, weird. that's fun. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I guess there's like, there's a kernel of truth to everything. And the way that he's obsessive about numbers, I guess you could say like, there are mathematicians who are obsessed, but I don't know of any mathematicians who's obsessed about Pi specifically, like just the constant Pi because there's so many more interesting things to be obsessed about mm -hmm. like general patterns or like formula yeah why would you pick pi that's kind of boring in my opinion when it's like is he a mathematician or just a lunatic right <laughs> i mean i guess he is a mathematician because he does do research in a sense yeah um, and he's uh very antisocial, which is classic math uh and is not obsessed about money just wants to be in his apartment and figure out pi so yeah there there's some truth to that i guess <laughs> no that's fair okay so what are the other math movies i guess the sister lunatic movie but not a mathematician are you familiar with jim carrey number uh, 23 no oh <laughs> I, yeah, I have not watched 23 but uh, yes i i am aware of it that that is pi without yeah. the uh math professor math researcher aspect <laughs> i guess the the there is a good movie which unfortunately i've not seen which was uh hidden figures oh yeah um, yeah the, very the, good and uh the, great to finally portray like the computers the work of minorities and women in math which is often overshadowed but uh it's great that they're finally getting a you know a good movie out and sort of illustrating the crucial work needed for like a pivotal moment in American history and in scientific history of and, landing on the moon. And how often do you get to invoke Euler during a, a movie? Oh, <laughs> you know, yeah. Euler's formula, like that was part of the problem solving. So, yeah, no, that's a good one. I guess the other big one, mathematics, economics, would be A, a Beautiful Mind. I don't know if you've uh, seen that one. I have not seen A Beautiful Mind. Um, 
I'm gonna maybe it's probably good, but is it a good math movie? Is probably more of a question. <laughs> oh, and John Nash, yes. Uh, that's yeah. That's which the okay. I, my issues with the John Nash film is that once again, it's because it's Hollywood. They feel the need to like really amp up like the human side of the story, and I feel like they like put too much emphasis on his like was it descent into dementia or some other mental it's, illness. Schizophrenia. Which, schizophrenia. Yeah. So like, I I wish that they could just like really reflect on like john nash was like a really important person who did amazing work yeah and it's like is that not enough like landing on the moon is good enough to be its own movie but you know coming up with um the nash equilibria is that not good enough <laughs> it doesn't convey on film well yeah. unfortunately <clears throat> i mean one thing i did appreciate about that movie is they had him like modeling behavioral patterns of pigeons but yeah. also think about economics which i mean it does harken to the like if you understand the fundamental relationships and mathematical basis of things it can be applied across many different domains absolutely and that wasn't that wasn't a focus but that was something like i appreciated about it like these are all problems that can be addressed in mathematical ways yeah and I am being extremely fast and loose in Fire Emblem. Like, luckily, we are just on chapter one. So oh, yeah, I don't we're, think I am in. We're one beer on on nine point four percent, so no one's judging. <laughs> but okay. JNPS, thank you for joining us for chat. First time chat. Thank you for mentioning the John Nash film. I mean, it's if you haven't seen it, it's worth watching. But again, it's watch it for the entertainment. And if they accidentally get some science or some math right, that's awesome as well. So. I'm trying to think if there's any others. Anyone in chat have a, a math movie that we should there, uh, well, visit or was, watch? There was a thought that occurred to me, but then it has disappeared. So I'll, maybe I'll, it'll come back to me and I'll remember. Yeah. Um, and so this is, it's open world, but uh, turn-based combat when yeah, you engage. turn-based, not fully open world. So uh, each level, there's a map. And once it gets back to my turn, uh, so here is the entire map of this level. So that bottom left, bottom right, top right, That's top the left. That's the whole map for this chapter. So it's turn-based and uh, it, it operates on a sort of rock, paper, scissors kind of pattern. So I guess let me go to one of the main characters of the story. This is Erica, the princess of Renee. Uh, she is a sword fighter. The other types of weapons are axes. And then lastly, there's lances. So we've got our cavalier and our knight. So swords have advantage on uh, axes. Axes have advantage on lances. And lances have advantage on swords. So the strategy is you want to sort of manipulate your characters so that you are killing the enemy while not exposing yourself to, to danger. Uh, so a turn-based strategy in that sense. J just Call Me Jar might have won the night. You could call Mean Girls a math movie, technically. <laughs> They're not that, wrong. They, that is, yes, that, uh, maybe that is the best uh, math movie. It is a spectacular movie. I honestly don't remember the math in that, but they, they did have they do a lot of calculus. math lawn. Like, when you watch that, are you solving those questions in your head? Because a lot of those are like, you have to have a tool set, right? Uh, like yeah, a... so I guess when I started teaching calculus, I got very proficient at solving Calc 1 problems in my head because I, I have to write the notes, I have to write the quiz, I have to write the test. So yeah. I got very good at knowing the tricks to speed up mm -hmm. and solve the problems faster. I mean, is there, I, I mean, you're, you're literally a professional mathematician. Is there utility in those or are those just like, uh, like party tricks? Uh, to me, they're more on the line of party tricks. Like okay. I, maybe to some degree, there's like a very small, uh, crossover to research math. Um, mm -hmm. but by and large, when you're sitting down and saying like, what's this integral from number a to number B by and large that's basically just well i've done this particular problem a thousand times before so i know what the answer is yeah and i can do the calculations in my head i uh, mean so i i guess that that the brings up a uh, question so these these mathletes like they're oops. they're training to be the best mathematician high school math people in the world but like it, it's not real math right like does, uh, does that skill set translate to grad school phd no not not at all whatsoever um 
uh, oops, I game over because I overextended. <laughs> All right. We should have saved state. Oh, yeah, yeah, we should have. This is why you rotate saves. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, this is no, why we have, rotate we have saves. 10 save states. So let me know when you want to save state and we'll we go back. We should probably save state every chapter. Just All right. So I don't have to replay this chapter again. Yeah, uh, just remind we'll, me. Hopefully, I don't get screwed over. Uh, I mean, that's, this is, that's intriguing because it's like, why. Does that exist? Though? So, like, okay, what's the so goal? yeah, that that it does raise a very good question, and even within math education, this is kind of largely debated. It's like, well, what's the point of learning all this tedious calculation-based math yeah. if it does not translate to quote unquote real math? Yeah. And I think the answer is that ultimately, you have to develop a very strong intuition behind the theory by first doing the calculations, and that's actually how like Leibniz, Newton, the progenitors of calculus figured it out by doing mind numbing calculations all day. I see. So and there then like is, the foundations just manifest when yeah, you understand so that well enough. When you do these calculations over and over again and you check them in a book and you understand like, okay, this is the correct calculation every time, you gain an appreciation of, I know this is the right answer. And then it's when you go back and do a proof course and you have to like build it from scratch, you say, I know what the answer should be, but why does it work? Mm -hmm. And then you have to like really develop the tools from the ground up. So it's like uh, that famous uh, Sagan quote, like to make an apple pie from scratch, first you must invent the universe. Yeah. So in math, when you first get to real analysis and you start proving calculus from the ground up, that idiom becomes a hundred percent true you you definitely appreciate like man i started from proving that a plus zero equals a is a unique expression <laughs> and then you get to like the uh, fundamental see. theorem of calculus it feels like you've conquered a mountain i see so so there is some sort there's some utility in that and in going into like developing new math and understanding the foundations of it but for your average learner i mean what would you advocate for if you were rewriting k through 12 math education um no I pressure think, but <laughs> I, so i do like what is going on in math education right now i'll, I'll sort of uh jump ahead of that because uh, surprise surprise math education is very contentious i mean you maybe grew up in the shadow of new math being phased out uh where i think it was back in the 50s and 60s in the with the space race going on and the us realizing that the soviets were way ahead of us in terms of science and math that they realized oh my gosh we need mathematicians and scientists now mm -hmm. and they revamped math education and they went to the math professors and said what should we be teaching elementary and middle school students to prepare them for math and science and they called it new math and it was a disaster to put it bluntly uh they taught them a lot of the fundamentals and the fundamentals being the axioms needed to prove things mm -hmm. and that turns out that's not a good idea to start with having students who are still forming like still growing and learning abstract thinking to do that before the mindless calculation. I like I, I disparage mindless calculation a lot, but there is a lot of utility in starting from that. And then once you are more mature and ready to then go on to the, the abstract thinking and the logical processing of like knowing why it's true. So new math kind of bombed. And then we went back to, I don't remember what comes after new math. Um, Okay, can we get another save state so I don't <laughs> yeah, game in do the it. same chapter? Shift F2, did it say save state I somewhere? I did not. I think you might have to click the one. Yeah, um, yeah okay, shift F2, like, we uh, should be good. Okay. Let's, let's check. All right, yeah. Yeah, okay. we're good. All right, uh, we save state, ladies this. and gentlemen. Let's do this again and properly. This I time. mean, so that the, the discussion about, you know, doing the math and then understanding where it comes from, this is actually, it comes up in chemistry a lot because a lot of general chemistry, the way it's historically taught is what we call plug and chug math, right? Like you yeah. have this equation and you put numbers in that equation and you get an answer. Yeah. And so that's, uh, the. I don't know if it's contentious now necessarily, but uh, the, the general lean right now by me and many others is that that is not an effective way to learn chemistry. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's so physical like, phenomena behind. Yeah. So I think there is value in the sense of like you you first need to build up that trust and intuition that the formula works. Yeah. It works for a reason. But there is that crucial step of once the students have sort of like matured enough to trust the formula works, then they need to understand why does it work? Mm -hmm. Where did it come from? It did not appear from thin air. It did not descend from up on high from <laughs> yeah. God himself. And he said, lo, this is the formula. And then we just believed it. Like it came from someone who figured it out and from first principles or some sort of logical basis knew that this was right so <laughs> that's fair i think that there is that sort of necessary and key step of you have to like convince the students that there is more beyond plug and chug that mm. it is necessary to grapple with these ideas and understand them on a fundamental basis and not just trust that a computer or a calculator will always deliver the answer on a mildly related note, that was one of the reasons like I became very sad. Like I grew up in this small religious town, right? But I, I became very cynical with religion, particularly structured religion and Christianity. It's because the Bible has a notable lack of any mathematical new insights or any scientific breakthroughs. Yeah. <laughs> it's like if if you're gonna divinely inspire all of humanity, it, it should come from on high. It should be like, here's the solvent, you're PNP, you're like, here's the solution. Like, I think Erdos had like a, a good quote about this where yeah. he said that the the natural numbers, so one, two, three, and so on, mm -hmm. those came from God, but everything else came from man. So, <laughs> and I, I feel like that's like in like a fundamentally true belief is that like, on some level, it feels like these things sort of came from the ether, if yeah. for a lack of any other expression. It's like, how do, like how do you come up with one, two, three? Like it feels like those are just like always existed, but then like developing negative numbers and zero and then yeah. complex numbers. All this feels like it sort of was created rather than discovered, which gets into a whole Oof. nother debate in and of itself. Yeah, I was going to say, that's that's some epistemological <laughs> gateway right there. That's intriguing. I guess the one that is, I don't know if you're familiar with this in the Bible, there's a suggestion on how to make a spherical foundation for a building. And if mm. you do the math, it has pi equal to three. <laughs> well, I mean, that's pretty good. Like it's not it, bad. For an estimate, that's not too Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for, for Bronze Age, yeah, you know, Bronze Age goat herders and the, like, yeah, that makes sense. But if it was divinely inspired, I want at least 10 digits of pi accuracy. <laughs> but anyway. All right. So going back to our, our movie question, <laughs> JNPS, there's that infamous Mobius strip reference in Endgame. Uh, I don't, I honestly don't remember. In game part two, or was that part one? What was it? It was the first a, one was time Infinity travel. War. Yeah. I did not see in game, which <sighs> like, it seems crazy now. Like I, I saw the part one because I went, I saw it with my best friend. We went to the movies cause we were just in town together mm -hmm. and then I just never followed up. And I, like, it was such a huge cultural landmark that like everyone went to go see in game. I still have yet to see it. <laughs> well, next time you get an opportunity, check out the Mobius strip scene. <laughs> I honestly don't remember it. I'm sure it's talking about time or something as a loop. Oh, I... Time is a Merbius band. <laughs> There's so many more interesting, like, like why not a climb? Bo yeah, John. <laughs> it's the worst part of the movie. <laughs> I know. Okay. I think my wife is actually in chat. I know she hates that scene in, um, what what was that Christopher Nolan movie about? Uh, oh, um, uh, Inception. In, not in, uh, about space travel. Oh, uh, Interstellar. Interstellar. She yeah. hates that part of Interstellar where they're like, love, love is, is the, the fourth, best force, the yes. fourth dimension or whatever. <laughs> well, like, I hate what they did to Anne Hathaway's character. Like, oh yeah, like she's just this really profound like scientist and really respected, and she just collapses under the weight of love is the biggest anyway. I feel for your wife, and I totally agree. That is ridiculous. Like, ruins the whole, like, point of the movie. Yeah. Oh, there, yeah there she is. It's so brutal. <laughs> <laughs> Just call me Jar. Welcome. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. That was that was so tragic, because everything else in that movie is just really elegant about the time dilation. You spend too That's, much time on Earth. And, it's a really good, like, plot device to sort of, like, spur the action. So, like, you can, like, compel the characters, like... There's a there's a great sense of urgency because you know, one second on this planet is like ten years yeah. or whatever. So no, that scene when they go back up to yeah. the ship and it's been twenty three years, yeah. and I'm like, like that gives such a good weight to the action. Oh. Where like, 
So I, it's sort of like a trope where like in a horror movie, like, oh, they're going to trip over the rock and then the serial killer who's walking the whole time will catch up to them. Yeah. Like, they're off screen. They were walking. They <laughs> ran away. Hit the character's off screen. They tripped over a tree branch or a, a rock and then the killer's right there. So it's like a trope that it's like you have to come up with some convincing way of like, why are the characters in danger or like, why do they need to utilize every second perfectly? Yeah. But Interstellar does it so well by like using the time dilation. I mean, uh, okay, my favorite know. part about that is like you tell that guy that just aged 23 years waiting for you on the surface that love is the biggest force. And <laughs> He's going to be like, know, are you kidding physics, me? <laughs> like, look me in the eye. Like, like, I should punch <laughs> you in the face. Like, <laughs> like that's you just wasted 23 years of my life just insulting. sitting in the spaceship. <laughs> insulting. <laughs> so yeah, just call me Jar. I totally agree with you. Uh, but the modeling, every time I have an astrophysicist on, they are... They, sing the praise of the modeling of black holes and whatnot in like it's super so, cool but man yeah no it's tragic they had to pollute it with love being the most powerful uh, anyway all right so we we took a journey on the movie question which is fun because yeah it's one of those i mean math shows up occasionally tangentially but there's a yeah. few central focused i definitely i still feel like there's room so any uh hollywood directors you know call me up I'll come up with a script. Um, <laughs> a you'll script. figure it out. No, you let's, let's let's do that. If you had to write a math movie, what would be your okay, historical so figure? If I had or... to write a movie, mm -hmm. and the easiest pick of my life, Alexander Grothendieck. The man, like his life story sounds like a spy movie. So he, I think he was in uh, Nazi-occupied France. What he, was like, the name? Alexander Grothendieck. G-R-O-E. There we go. There we go. Alexander Grothendieck. All right. He might, is he still alive? I forget. Uh, uh, no, nope. he, died. he died at 86 in 2014. So, okay. B born to Berlin to anarchist parents. And he is in France when the Nazis occupy France. He like escapes like a boarding school or something and like plans to assassinate Hitler. And he's like, I'm going to kill Hitler. And then like gets, he like stops or something. Yeah. yeah he's arrested. And then he's like, all right, well, now I'm just going to literally change the entire field of abstract algebra. So, <laughs> you know, like backup plan. <laughs> yeah. So it's like that. The, how is that not compelling? Like that's Hollywood ready right now. So call me up. We, we can figure this out. <laughs> oh, man. I hope somebody's listening to that because that, that sounds like a fun story. So the other math movie, I, I forgot about this one. I don't know oh, if you've heard of this. I Gifted. Gift, I have not watched it. You have it. not watched it. I mean, this is, again, a young savant yeah, doing I, mathematics. I don't like the young savant because it feels like an overplayed trope, especially in math. But at least with Growth and Deke, it's true. Yeah. And there's other stuff going on that makes it compelling. Yeah. So, no, that's fair. I mean, that's it's it's one of the... It's not just like math and science movies. The, the like Harry Potter's of the world that are just good at shit. They just inherit the best at everything. Yeah, and you the find reality out about is, a world you never knew and then it turns out you're the best Quidditch player the world's ever seen even though you've never touched a broom before. You don't know magic. Exactly. And it's like zero respect to the reality of you have to work your ass off to be good at literally anything. So I can appreciate that. One thing I do appreciate about Gifted is they do talk about like the, you know, I don't know what they're called, the, the seven challenges or the, the the main challenges. Yeah. And it also touches on, you know, a mathematician that's depressed and suicide and leaves a daughter behind and like overbearing parents. It, it's, it's uh, again, it's personal relationship based, but I, I think they capture some aspects of that well. I'd be curious. Next time you're on, your homework list is what? <laughs> a beautiful mind, gifted, <laughs> um, man who knew infinity. What yeah. else do we, Mean and Girls, you've seen that? I have seen Mean Girls. <laughs> I, I had to drop the reference in my, one of my calc classes when, That's what awesome. is it? The, it's October, is, is it October 3rd is the special day? I yeah, I think it's, remember. what day is it? It's October 3rd. <laughs> I think that's the quote. Uh, let, let's get another save state going. Okay. This, that's too sh this is not a particularly tricky chapter, but it, it is kind of. Let me check if that. Yeah, we're yeah, good. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so I think, wait, I know I need to rescue this guy first. And then go here. Mean Girls. Oh, also going back on our list, you need to watch Endgame. Uh, yeah, yeah, gotta finish up in game. <laughs> yep, you need some analogy involving of a, maybe it's not even analogy, Mobius or Morbius strip, Morbius, Morbius. 
Can't forget your own lots, ladies and gentlemen. Gotta get the more billion strips. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. All right, man, we're an hour and 23 minutes in. We need to do another prediction. So Let's do... I like this one. The... Yeah. The... Complex. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do another prediction. If you're not clicking follow, click the follow button. And get standard internet units. And also, it helps our visibility of our channel. The more followers we have, it moves us up on the priority list. But also, you can use those standard internet use in any units you get for following us to gamble them or bet them or, I don't know, just convey the degree of confidence in the answer to a question. Uh, our theme of the night is which came first. And so we're comparing uh, mathematical innovations versus major historical events. And so the question that's up on the screen right now, if you click that predict button, you can decide which came first, complex numbers or Gregorian calendar, which was first, I guess, verified or, or instated by the Pope in 1582. And so what came first, complex numbers or the Gregorian calendar? And complex numbers being, what's your easy definition so, of that? Uh, so you, root you, of learn, one. you learn that you cannot take the square root of a negative number. Mm -hmm. Well, what if you could? Yep. Well, if you wanted to do that, you would have to define a new thing for that to be. You'd have to say, well, let's create a definition. That definition is a complex number or an imaginary number for just the root of a negative number. Um, the more complicated answer is that it allows us to solve all polynomials. <laughs> so it turns out that if you allow for polynomials with complex coefficients, you can always solve them. You will always have roots that are complex numbers. There's no higher tier uh, in terms of like forming some polynomial. So that you can't make a polynomial of complex numbers and then say, oops, actually this one's also unsolvable. So they're, they're kind of special in that way. All right, so which came first, complex numbers or 1582, also the day that Gregorian calendar was adopted? Which is intriguing. Again, complex number is something we take for granted now, but somebody had to do it first, and they were probably seen as a lunatic. So, which came first, complex numbers or the Gregorian calendar? All right, 10 seconds left. Throw your bets in there. Oh, people are bumping up their numbers. Confidence is increasing. I love the game theory behind oh, this, yeah. by the way. I, I don't know if you played on the I, other side of this, but... Oh, yeah. I have I tried very hard to pick things that were close together. Yeah. All right, Alex, what is the answer? The answer is complex numbers, which surprised me when I first learned this, was that complex numbers are older than the Gregorian calendar. <laughs> and it's not by much. Um, it's uh, like a couple decades. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's mid-1500s, right? Yeah, that was it, the... it was, I want to say like 1540-something. Yeah. Uh, may, or maybe 1550. Um, huh. Both in Italy. So, so the, the Pope Gregory was the one who came up with the Gregorian calendar. And yeah, I could not believe Gregorian calendar is newer than complex numbers. That just, like, <laughs> is still so surprising. That blew your mind. Yeah. Well, congratulations to those of you that said complex numbers, and you did so confidently. So congratulations on your standard internet units. You definitely earned them in that particular case. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's an intriguing complex numbers. I mean, so do you have... I mean, let's translate this back to everyone's day-to-day -day lives. Why, why do, why should people care about complex numbers? Um, they serve a very important role of allowing to model certain dynamical behavior. So it turns out that like dynamical systems are like really well handled by complex numbers, and um, I think electric fields are also you you model those with complex numbers. So there's a lot of important things that uh, maybe you don't in, like you you're not thinking about in your day-to-day -day life, but it was necessary for the framework to, you know, be able to build up your day-to-day -day usage. Like anything that's electronic, you're like built on the backs of giants and those giants being math, complex numbers, um, like roots of polynomials, all that good stuff came from math. Mm -hmm. So I think when I took linear algebra in uh, graduate school, the first time, actually, yeah, the first time, um, the professor pulled out her cell phone and said, do you know why this works? <laughs> linear algebra. <laughs> the reason that your phone works is because of linear algebra. The, the, so the way that they compress your voice into yeah. a digital file is with matrix multiplication and decomposition, which mm -hmm. is what we learned. So yeah. it's kind of 
<laughs> you bring out something concrete like that, like your yeah. your smartphone would not exist without math. So I need you to be quiet. Yeah. No complaining. I mean that the, the number of aspects that go into your phone working. I mean, from the GPS and relativity to photodynamics to electrodynamics to yeah. That is a fun example. And it's one of those things we try to convince, you know, Congress people that it's necessary to support basic science. And they ask, why? Why is this going to be useful? And the answer is, I don't know. Ask me in a thousand years. Like, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's the like big problem about math is you ask, like, when is this applicable? It's like, well, I don't know. Ask the scientists in 200 years who are going to need this. Yeah, like, yeah. The, the people doing like quantum field theory and developing the first quantum algorithms to crack codes, that's built off of the backs of math. So... Mm -hmm. Like it wouldn't be done without the math, and you know, I I forget which mathematician said it, but they there was I mean there's been a long-standing debate about like should math have applications? Like just should it have applications in the first place? Like should we do math for math's sakes, or should there be some end goal? And I forget if it's Hilbert. I don't think it is. Someone I think corrected me before, but I, I'll just say Hilbert for the sake of the story. Hilbert claimed. He came up with a theory of math, which is completely impractical. It will never have a real life use. He said it's the purest form of math, only interesting to mathematicians. Mm -hmm. And he invented cryptography, <laughs> which is the foundation behind modern banking. Yeah. So it's like, even when we try to come up with stuff that doesn't have applications, eventually someone's going to figure it out yeah. and it's going to be revolutionary. <laughs> That's an awesome lens to look at it. All right. Another one of our canned questions. What's your favorite equation? Okay. So as a, an analyst, I don't work with equations. I work with inequalities. Uh. So, uh, there is a, actually a funny story. My first algebra professor said, what's the difference between analysts and algebraists? Algebraists work with equations, analysts work with inequalities. <laughs> so my favorite and probably most used inequality is the triangle inequality, which says that each side of a triangle is shorter than the sum of the other two sides. Huh. So no side of a triangle can be longer than the other two sides combined, which it's it's something that seems so obvious that you wouldn't think it needs to have a name yeah. and yet it gets used so much and that's <laughs> kind of like the running theme of like things that seem obvious in math are the things that get used the most because mm. it really is that obvious stuff that is the linchpin behind so many other things i'll just casually hit that 25 percent I mean, so th this this harkens to like proofs, right? Because there's certain axioms you assume that are acceptable yes. into any proof. Yeah. And and like you're building on the backs of previous proofs to use those axioms. Yes. And so uh, essentially everything you use <laughs> falls under yeah. that framework, right? Like, yes. And I I will say like for a research mathematician, I rarely think of the axioms. Mm -hmm. uh, I am almost exclusively thinking on like a higher level of like, I know this theorem from somebody else and I know this lemma. Like yeah. you get to the higher tier stuff where it's like, you're resting on that stuff, but that stuff rested on lower tier stuff. So like, yeah, it, you can distill it all down to axioms if you want, Yeah. but you, you get comfortable you at a high enough level that you can essentially ignore the axioms or if you are using them, you're using them like, as naturally as you and I breathe. Is there an example or one you know off the top of your head where like we've built on the shoulders of giants, but then we found out someone was wrong along the way? Like there was assumed knowledge yeah. that- um, I know of an example of, there was uh, a friend of mine from undergrad did a uh, REU in I think Hawaii. And the professor that she worked with um, had this project and ultimately at the end of the project, at the end of the REU, they disproved something or they, they proved there was an edge case that was not covered by some theorem. So they, they disproved the theorem, but then they, I think they sharpened it because you had to have slightly more restrictive conditions for it to still be true. Mm -hmm. um, so that does happen. Um, I mean, how devastating is that? It's not like the foundation crumbles. Uh, it just makes the It's rarely lower. like foundationally shaken. Like there's mm. a, 
there's a, an entertaining and maybe somewhat interesting video by uh, Veritasium who talks about um, essentially Godel's incompleteness theorem, where mm. he he talks about like the the gap in the, uh, I think you, you, I don't know if you accidentally reset one of my what? save states, but what? okay, well it's still it's still fine, I think. All right, so we will just apply heal real quick. It shouldn't have. Or maybe I I pressed a button I didn't. Huh. I, I, was, I, <laughs> I hope I didn't assign a hotkey yeah. somewhere accidentally. Let's see if can. I hope this is a safe play. I'm about to do something a little risky. Uh, Ross kind of is terrible, so it's not it's not the worst thing if he dies. Uh, no worries. Um, I mean, we're an hour and a half in, so yeah. if you want to switch at any point, let me know. Uh, I mean, so this one, what, what does this date back to? This is elementary uh, school? Uh, so actually, uh, yeah, this is early 2000s, but I did not play it until high school. From uh, a good friend of mine, actually, uh, we were talking in high school, and I think I told him, "Yeah, I have never played a Fire Emblem game." And he's like, "What?" And he, <laughs> How he dare brought you? it to he brought it to school and was like, "All right, you got to play this." And I feel like this is like an experience that a lot of like today's kids just aren't going to get, like the game swapping yeah. experience of like. I mean, so you physically brought your Game Boy Advanced and Game uh, Boy Color. I mean, and... like I didn't bring it to school like every day, but like I, I brought my Game Boy Advance that day. I plugged it in, and then like I took it home and played it then. But like. Yeah, like I loaned out my copy of Pokemon Emerald to like my bet one of my best friend's younger brothers. Yeah. Like, it was just kind of a thing that's like, I have this awesome game and I want to share it with people. So it's like, oh, if I've already played through it, well, here, you borrow it, play through it, and then tell me what you think. And it feels like such like a core experience to especially like the late nineties and early two thousands when like Game Boy, Game Boy Advance was like readily accessible relatively small so there wasn't the whole like portability factor you had to think about yeah no and I'll, I'll 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 echo that sentiment in that time window because like early like halo one yeah. you had to be network connected right you could do yeah. 16 players but you had to have four xboxes and a and a router and physically connect them or you had to be in the dorms on the dorm network and there was something you know yeah it was team building it was relationship building but in their defense now i mean you can do there's certain games like the switch where one can have the game and four people can connect and things like that i don't know what if fall guys does that i don't remember which games okay good <laughs> but there are some games you can network uh one person owns it and the others can play it as well <laughs> so there's still opportunities for that out there Inequalities. <laughs> Should I change that question to what's your favorite equation slash inequality, or you're the only yeah. one that's probably going to answer I mean, that? Maybe some other math people will get in on it, or maybe yeah. the physicists will get in on it. There's probably, <laughs> there's probably at least one like really interesting physics inequality. Yeah. I I wonder if any physicist like really loves Holder's inequality for some reason, because I had to like... I had to live and breathe Holder's inequality for like a what, week. What's it used for? What's the um, general domain? It's so... Uh, it's in you learn it in measure theory um it comes up with integrals where you have like the integral of two different functions and you want to bound it by something that's easier to work with mm -hmm. so holder's inequality gives you that by separating the two so it's like you have an integral and you have two functions that are being multiplied together i'm I, okay I, I don't need to get flamed in chat if i misremember holders <laughs> i think it's if you have the integral of the product of these two functions say f and g you can bound it above by the integral of f and the integral of g and maybe you need to like square the the inequal the two uh the two uh, integrals on the right hand side but it, it usually it's just a way of like if you have two functions that are kind of tangled together it lets you separate them I and see. then if you can usually you hope that one of them you can just outright integrate and get the answer of and then you go okay this thing that i had no idea about i took it apart one thing i was able to solve and the other thing is just easier to notice so i'm able to sort of like make that connection so like complicated thing is bounded by easy thing so that's kind of like the goal of holders inequality but i see since it's an integral inequality i would imagine there's some sort of way that you could apply this to physics but i have no idea so. <laughs> that's fair next time i have a physicist done i think their answer answer more than often than not is uh euler's relation or oh, yeah. euler's equation that's that's yeah. their go-to for engineers and physicists i think that's their i don't know the elegance of it is really exciting 
But to me, an inequality, I, I guess I'm biased because I'm an analyst. An inequality is interesting because it's sort of like, I, it tells me a relationship between two things in a way of like, this thing is small, this thing's big. So like, if I know something about the smaller thing, that tells me about the bigger thing or vice versa. Whereas an, in, an, an exact equality is kind of like restrictive because it's like, then I can only really use it in exactly one way and that's to go from one side to the other. And it's like, I can translate one thing as this thing is basically the same as this other thing, which in analysis very rarely happens. But I guess for algebraists that is a little bit more common. So, so JNPS, for uh, physics, the uncertainty principle is an inequality, isn't it? I, I, it probably is. Uh, there's probably some way you can distill it down to like a math inequality, I guess. Um, yeah, it, it's often described as a, um, it's an equation, right? Because there's a relationship between, you know, velocity and position and uh, time and energy. I've seen it in an equation form, but that's interesting. It is an in inequality, man. Uncertainty uh, yes, principle. I can see it. it looks like it's uh, where is it? Del is it Del X Del Lam? Uh, okay, I I'm not familiar with the Sigma A Sigma B uh, version. Scroll down a little bit. Mm. Right there, yeah. Del X Del P greater or equal to. Oh yeah, that's true. That's, that's yeah. So it looks yeah, like it is an inequality. And... Position and momentum. Yeah, I guess greater than or equal to. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, just call me Jar. Putting those standard internet units to work has requested a factoid. Okay, so I skimmed over this because I think it is sort of funny and like wraps everything together with gaming and math. So when I talked about my background and why I got into math, probably this had a non-zero effect on my like eventual getting into math was I am a Pokemon kid. I grew up like right when Pokemon Red and Blue, like came out and just swept the country uh, and everyone became obsessed with Pokemon. And I had a Pokemon math workbook. It was a workbook that had pictures of the Gen 1 Pokemon and then it had like the times tables. So you like worked out multiplication and addition. And I loved that because I guess I was like kind of good at math, but then I loved it because I was like working the problems and I was like looking at the Pokemon. So that, <laughs> like they had no relation to the actual. Like, no, yeah, like there was, there was nothing the like page. you solved like how many <laughs> how many spines are on Nido King's back. No, yeah, it was it was, just, it was just like they slapped a bunch of Pokemon stickers on a math workbook yeah. to trick us into doing math, oh, and it, it absolutely worked. You got tricked by branding, but for yeah. math, so it's for the greater good. So totally yes. worth it. <laughs> So there you go. Just call me Jar. Alex is a mathematician because of Pokemon workbook. I mean, I, I don't think you can like definitively say it absolutely what caused a chain of events, but like it had to be a non-zero effect. Like, uh, and I, I guess more to that is that with Pokemon, it is an RPG, so there's all the the damage calculation and the like. Learning about super effectiveness doubles your attack, so. I guess there's so much of the number sense that goes into it that it kind of all comes together eventually. Um, so I've not been paying attention or know this game at all. How are you doing? Okay, I'm doing fine. I haven't had anyone die after we reset. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think. So the one here's what I love about this one compared to the first Fire Emblem that came in the West, which was it's nowadays called Fire Emblem Seven because it's the seventh in the overall series, is that. With this strategy game, they offered a lot of like multiple routes. So like the the normal way to play this is that you'll come up here, there's a door up here. You'll come through the door, you'll beat this guy, you'll open these chests. Maybe you'll come down here and kill these guys and open this chest. You'll come here, you can kill these guys, and then ultimately you're working towards the boss. But they also included these breakable walls right here, mm -hmm. which have a health meter so let's see if i if i attack it so the the wall currently has 10 health <laughs> i'm about to do nine damage so once this wall breaks it opens a new path that i can bust in here and kill this guy first yeah and then come down here and kill this guy so like they they, they we're still early in the game so they're introducing the idea of like there's more than one route that you can take to plan your maneuvering to ultimately get to the boss and then later on they offer like different routes where it's like if you go one way you can recruit a character 
But if you go the other way, you can get a, like a really good item. Mm -hmm. So it introduces this like interesting choice as a player where you have to decide like, do I want the opportunity to get a new character to join my party or do I want to just get the really good item? Or sometimes you can do it like if you do it really, really well and you like execute your plan perfectly, you can get both things. So there's like a, a huge amount of replayability with this that I absolutely loved and keep coming back to this game in particular because I think it does the multiple routes a lot better. Curious if there's a uh, the sacred stone. I'm looking up the speed runs on this. This I do know is uh, RNG manipped. They they have to they do, know how to do it. RNG manips to do the whole thing. So. I know some people kind of don't like RNG Manip runs because it's kind of like it it takes I don't want to say it takes the execution out because it, there is a very yeah, high degree technical. of execution, like very technical. But I think it kind of fits more into like the research aspect where it's like they spend a lot of time really routing, figuring out like yeah. if I do this, if I do like this particular sequence of actions, I can get a crit on the boss, he'll miss me, and then I'll crit him back and I kill him in one turn. I see. So there's a whole lot of like really f like digging into the RNG table to figure out uh, what the perfect s like series of steps you need to execute your plan flawlessly. So so what's your guess on speed run time? Uh, I think, well, I forgot if it was this one or the previous one that I think at some point it was down to like a min an hour 30 um what is it currently right now hour and three minutes hour three okay and the top three are within uh, I mean, kirby master 30 still, minutes kirby master's still up there he's the yeah. one that i um okay i do have the chess key yeah he's six the one years that, ago he's the one that's like crazy in this one and i think kirby games huh so i i've watched a couple of his like uh speed runs at gdq yeah it's pretty fun very cool um okay let's do this oh, we're in three minutes I mean, since the times are so close, this is pretty optimized, presumably. Well, optimized for those I mean, that run it. it, it the, I think that's what makes it so interesting, is that, like, is it optimized? Maybe. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, you'd have to, like, dig into the RNG tables to find, like, if I sacrifice five minutes on Chapter 1, does that save seven minutes on Chapter 20? Yeah. So, it's it's one of those things, as far as I'm aware, where it yeah, kind yeah. of, like there's there's still always the possibility of like maybe someone else will find like the god run that like hits all the perfect rng and saves all that extra time that we didn't think was possible earlier but it actually does um okay i'm going to can i steal this guy what yes i can steal ai this guy. and evolutionary algorithms are for <laughs> somebody else figure out that shit. <laughs> i am sort of interested like is it possible to do like uh like train a neural network to attempt to do speed run tech and then does it come up with new ideas no Which, so there's there, there are examples of this i don't know if you've seen any of these on youtube but they, they start with games like mario and stuff like that and try to optimize them but the 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 hard part of them is defining the the condition mm, right because yeah. how you, you you get monkey pod depending on how yeah. you define that condition and so it, it, it's intriguing area it, 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 definitely it feels is. to me like what you would want to do is you want to develop a neural net but you want to teach it at least the bare like you want to like start it with a node where it knows the basic actions of the game so it knows like up down left right mm -hmm. ba start select and maybe lr or i don't know whatever controller you're working with but then you also teach it like um i with mario like you you what is it where you like hold left while running right mm -hmm. and that like sl starts you slightly faster yeah yeah so it seems to me like if you taught it like a couple of those techniques in the early eons, maybe it could use those to figure out like, oh, I should be doing these techniques at like certain phases. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know how, if there's any serious work that's going on in that area. Yeah. I mean, serious work, I don't know. It's hard to get NSF funding on, yeah. on video game solving, but uh, there's definitely a lot of people, I, I appreciate the effort they put into solving these problems. But there, it seems like there's too many games that it just it requires like technical human knowledge that you can't just throw a, a neural network at. Like there's there's too much like background knowledge that a human needs in order to do some of the speedruns that yeah, I don't think like a naive neural net 
would be able to do this, but maybe in like 10 years. <laughs> yeah, like, I was going to say, in defense it, of neural networks, that is what we are, literally. So, like, what knowledge set did we need to make those decisions, and can that be simulated in Computo? Presumably, yeah. yes, at some point. Maybe but you're right, it, the, those scenarios where it's like something on level 5 saves you a certain amount of time on level 20, like an iterative optimization doesn't necessarily search for that. And so, yeah, it's an intriguing question. So it, it, you get into this like trade-off of like a human can decide like or can can have the foresight to know like level one one is purely optimized. Like we, we have it down to a frame perfect solution. So don't waste time searching for solutions mm -hmm. there. Whereas like if you're starting from scratch with a neural network, it has to do everything. So yep. as of right now, I don't unless there's some sort of like hybrid method that you could develop where you say focus on just this level and get up to the current proficiency that humans are at and then maybe it'll come up with an interesting idea but from what i've seen from neural networks they usually don't have interesting ideas um it's just a lot of like pattern recognition on like a high on a higher level huggy beer welcome back good to see you good evening hopefully I have a drink in hand we started the night with um, what is it? Brothers Theolonius Belgian style Abbey Ale, which a certain portion of the proceeds goes towards to helping jazz scholarships, which is kind uh, of fun. Yes. But also it's a 9.4% alcohol drink. So yeah, we've been invested in the alcohol tonight. Um, but yeah, if you're just joining us, our guest today is Dr. Alex White, a recent PhD graduate in mathematics in particular, um, what did you call it? It was uh, uh, geometric measure theory. Geometric but I, measure we, theory. If we want to simplify, I was looking at fractals for a very long time. All right, Huggy Beer starting out strong, requesting a factoid. Okay. Um, but also, we're nine minutes yeah. in, or nine hour. Or, Jesus Christ, an hour and fifty minutes in. Yeah. We keep playing, or do you want to switch? Let's see if I can clear this room and maybe the other room. All right. Sounds good, but factoid. Uh, okay, so I'll talk about um, what's close to my research area, which um, I was looking at packings and coverings, which is, it, it kind of sounds, it is what it sounds like, where you have some domain and maybe if I could get back control, I could like illustrate with the game with my cursor. Um, that's a pretty good level up, but... Seth, Seth is good, and even if he has. I hate up. the fact yeah. that they put you on the right side, even though you're on the left on the screen. Yeah. But anyway, so let's imagine in this room that I'm highlighting here, I have these four barrels, and I want to place them in the room such that they are as far apart from all other barrels as possible. Well, there's kind of like an obvious choice of you push them to the corners, so you push the four barrels to the corners. And that's a pretty good packing or covering where you've like you've spread the object as as much out as possible so that there's not two really close together. So that's kind of what we were doing, but we were doing them on fractals. Uh, fractals, are they infinitely long? Um, they are there's a not a like holistic one definition for fractals and I kind of like that that's the way it is right now. So to me, a fractal is something that behaves fractal-like. So touching, <laughs> touching back, back on earlier. Back to our defining a definition based on the definition. But <laughs> to me, and I know this maybe doesn't apply to everything, a fractal is something that is non-integer dimension. So now I have to justify, well, what do you mean by non-integer dimension? So a line, a straight line, a flat line is one dimensional, right? Because you can only go one one direction you can either go right or it's opposite left so we'll confine direction meaning like you can go one way or exactly it's opposite a plane or the sphere is two-dimensional because you can go up or it's opposite down you can go right or it's opposite left so you have a choice of like two independent directions that you can travel well what would something that's not quite two-dimensional but more than one dimensional need to act like. So this is where you have to kind of steep deep into some geometric measure theory where you ask yourself, what is the volume or let's do area. 
What's the area of a line, a flat line? <laughs> Zero. Yeah. Because it's only, it's completely flat. Yeah. So you can only go left and right, There's but no area XY. needs to be, you know, up, down, and left and right. So a line has zero area. Well, we can sort of equivalently say that, like a square, what's the length of a square? Not the length of its side, not the length of a diagonal, the length of the square. So if I peeled apart a square, line by line, what would that length be? It would be infinite, because there's infinitely many line Slices. segments that I've stacked together to make a square. So in the same way that a line has zero area, so two dimensions, a square, which is two dimensions, has infinite length, which is one dimensional. Hmm. So. In, me in measure theory, we wrap all these together and call it a measure. So there's the one dimensional measure, which is length, the two dimensional measure, which is area, the three dimensional area, which is volume, and then anything higher than three dimensions, we, we just all call it volume or hyper volume if you want to be specific. So then something that is bigger than one dimensional, but smaller than two dimensional would need to have positive length, but not infinite uh, length because, or I guess non, it needs to be smaller than zero area. So what you can get is you can get something like a Brownian motion where you have a completely random process that's like zigzagging all over the place. And if that Brownian motion like uh, squiggles in on itself, that length will be infinite because if you completely unravel it all the way, it becomes an infinite line. So it has infinite length, but it definitely has zero area because it is just like a, a line that just squiggles on itself a lot. Mm -hmm. So a fractal would be anything that fits in between dimensions. So for <laughs> fractals that are between one and two, they basically look like Brownian motion. They look like squiggly lines of some kind. Um, anything that's between two and three would be a surface that's like really rough and like squiggled together. Yeah, a sphere is two dimensional because to to mathematicians, a sphere is only the 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 edge and not the interior. So <laughs> it had the, the, doesn't have volume. The, the interior <laughs> yeah. is a ball. So yeah. mathematically speaking, a circle is one dimensional. <laughs> Uh, mathematically, a circle is defined as the union of points equidistant from the center. Mm -hmm. So it's only the points, not the interior. The interior is called the disc. <laughs> um, we'll we'll switch over to Halo because I'm not. <laughs> no, you dove deep on that <laughs> yeah, one. Huggy thinking. Beer, I hope you got your money's worth out of that factoid because that was a journey. Fractals are between dimensions. So there, there's a really interesting uh, example that I think works well called the, the coastline paradox, where um, if you want to consider something like what's the coastline of Britain, and let's say you want to be completely fully accurate. So it's not enough to estimate it by kilometers. You say, I want to get it down to the particle level accurate, but then I want to go even further. So you're like, I want exact accuracy. Well, in calculus, the way that you define things like um, d derivatives and integrals is you define it as a limiting sequence. You say, this limit exists if I take a series of steps, and if those series of steps slowly approach a fixed value or number, then that limit is what the answer should be for the derivative or the integral. So you can do the same thing for links. You can for lengths, L-E-N-G-T-H. I know I sound like I'm saying links. <laughs> um, you can say the length of an arced curve is the limit of straight line edges that connect it all together. And if that limit is well defined, that's what your length is. So you can define arc lengths like that. You can ex you can exactly solve what the circumference of any circle is by doing that method. It's just a limit. Um, so let's say we want to do a limit of, let's say, the coastline of Great Britain, so the British Isle, not including Ireland. It turns out that that is not a well-defined limit. That limit goes to infinity. So if that limit was a finite positive number, that would tell us that coastline, at least the coastline of Britain, is a one-dimensional thing. But because it's infinite, 
we know it's bigger than one dimensional, but we also know that the coastline, that's definitely not two dimensional because there's not area to it. I mean, if you're ignoring the beach, if you say like, let's say it's just exactly where the water meets the sand in a one dimensional sense. So coastlines of several countries have actually been like approximated to a very high degree. And the coastline of Britain is dimension. Uh, I think it's the last time it was calculated was, I think they said it was like 1.25. And uh, the coastline of Ireland, I think was also recently calculated. I think like 10 or so years ago, which was 1.24. <laughs> so officially the coastline of Britain is higher dimensional than the coastline of Ireland. Now you're starting fights. <laughs> so, not length, but dimension wise. Dimension wise. And then perhaps unsurprisingly, the dimension of Norway's coastline is like way bigger. So what's the highest dimension coastline? Uh, I don't think every country's been measured. I think the highest that I know of, I believe, is Norway, huh. which sort of makes sense. Yeah. Where can we use fractals in a practical way? So true fractals, I don't know, but I think there's a good way where you can say we can approximate things that are behave fractal-like and use mm -hmm. the inherent properties that we know of certain fractals to estimate certain quantities. All, All right, right. This is exactly where we're supposed to be. Nice. All right. We're in Halo 2. Yep. Halo 2, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, one of our guests, Billy Oates, who's a mechanical engineer, he, I, I think he got his PhD in mathematics or postdoc in mathematics. He used fractal math to describe uh, mechanical properties and materials, like stress and strain and stretching and compression. It is a, I yeah. guess, fractal-like behavior. You can, I guess you can observe that like the stress lines will, mm -hmm. will show up in a fractal-like manner. Mm -hmm. um, for me, looking at um, packings and coverings, the sort of application that I always use as my elevator pitch is that, so right now there's a whole lot of work being done on trying to map out where electric vehicle charging stations should be. Mm. And so that's a ultimately a packing problem of you have these resources that obviously you don't want all of your uh, packing or you don't want all of your electric charging stations right next to each other they need to be sort of spread out but they also need to like obey certain population uh, distributions like you know there's a lot of people in california so there should be a lot of charging stations in california there's not a lot of people in wyoming so probably don't need to put a whole lot in wyoming mm -hmm. but the other consideration that you need to keep in mind is that the u.s has a very long coastline and something like was it like 60 or 70 percent of the u.s population is on the coast or within 100 miles of the coast mm -hmm. so you have a very large amount of the population lives next to the coast and the coast is fractal like so you have to keep in mind that if you want to do a type of packing problem like finding how to distribute some important resource or like some electric charging stations that you ultimately have to respect the fractal properties of that coastline when you're keeping that into account so you can't just do like a simple, you know, grid where like we'll just put every all of them in rectangles and then that'll just work itself out. Because there's like currently a problem right now where there's like they're working on like getting a charging station between Texas, I think Dallas and Denver, because there's like a 500 mile stretch where <laughs> you're there's like on your own. <laughs> yeah, there's like you're just SOL if you yeah you're in there. That's pretty fun. So. Yeah, you have to like keep that in mind. I mean, so evolutionary algorithms often find fractal-like behavior just spontaneously, but like circulatory system, tree branches, these yeah, like all our, exhibit fractal our, patterns. Our circulatory system is definitely fractal-like mm -hmm. because uh, inevitably, problem. like when you have to access a very large area with a minimizing constraint. So for us, it's like our circulatory system needs to reach every part of the body, but it needs to use up as few resources building that circulatory system as possible. Mm -hmm. That's an optimization problem, and that is ultimately going to use fractal-like properties. So it kind of naturally comes up in dynamics and certain optimization type problems where you're trying to like optimize something with a minimal amount of something being used, and anything that is inherently geometry related is kind of 
gonna naturally fit in that idiom. <laughs> Huggy Beer found a business opportunity. Sounds like I need to set up a very slow diner on that road with a charging station. <laughs> a diner, maybe, maybe a movie theater, you know. I would, I would be willing to bet that um, the battery technology is not going to improve so much that people can stop in five minutes and then be on their way. So you can convince them to get a bite to eat. Huggy Beer, do it. <laughs> do it. I'll, I'll swing by on the way when I take that trip once in my entire life. Have any grenades. No worries. All right, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> anyone just joining us, Ask the Scientist Gaming, Mediocre Gameplay Expert Science. We're playing a little bit of Halo 2 with uh, Dr. Alex White, who's an expert in, uh, well, mathematics in general, and also math, math education you're interested in. Um, yeah, fractals. We can talk about fractals and their various different we'll applications. Talk about a lot of different fractals. I spent a lot of time <laughs> looking at different fractals. <laughs> Which sounds intriguing, but underappreciated. We talked about throughout the evening the 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 underappreciated aspect, the unsung hero that is mathematics and fundamental uh, math and learning math as it's applied in various different disciplines. So, if you guys have any questions, throw them in chat. If if not, uh, we'll we'll keep going, playing a little bit of Halo Two. It's been a journey through various generations of games, actually. I tried to pick a bunch of games that were important to me in some way, but also would be like relatively entertaining to watch. I yeah. figured you know, trudging through the first two hours of a Pokemon game are probably not the best <laughs> use of our time. That's fair. As much as Pokemon was kind of like a very formative gaming moment in my life. Just call me Jar wants to know, what's your favorite fractal? Okay. Uh, I don't want to say it's my favorite, but it's the one I've grappled with the most, which is called the Cantor One Third Set. It's pretty easy to describe. So imagine you take a stick, and for our sake, it's a math stick, so it has only length, no width, and it's one meter long. From that one meter long stick, cut away the middle third. So the middle one-third meter, you're gonna cut that away, leaving the left one-third and the right one-third. So you've made two smaller sticks, one-third the length of the original stick. Repeat the process for each of the smaller sticks. So for the, uh, for the left side, you're gonna cut out its middle third. For the right side, you're gonna cut out its middle third. And now you have four sticks and they are totaling is four ninths because you have four of them and each of them is one ninth the original meter do it again and keep doing this process infinitely many times until all you have left is a very very fine dust that dust is what we call the cantor set <laughs> it is a set which has zero length because remember we cut away one third and then we cut away another one ninth and one ninth if you add up the total area or the total length that we cut away, that adds up to one. So it has zero length, but it's uncountable, which we can talk about different kinds of infinity, which I know is very popular to think about. Um, it's an uncountable infinity, which is sort of strange because that means there are more points in this set than rational numbers. So a rational number is any fraction of whole numbers. So 2 over 3, negative 7 over 32, any fraction like that where it's a whole number up top, whole number on bottom, make it positive or negative, doesn't matter. Those are all rational numbers. There are more endpoints in that Cantor dust than fractions. <laughs> That is intriguing. Various different versions of yeah. infinity. <laughs> so it is a it is a fractal because it is more than zero dimensional. Yeah. Which and there is a mathematical rigorous sense of zero dimensional, but it's not one dimensional because it doesn't have length. So here's my favorite line, and this is intriguing. The uh, Wikipedia page on Cantor set. It was discovered in 1874 by Henry John Stephen Smith and introduced by German mathematician Gregor Cantor in 1883. So Cantor didn't discover it. He did a lot of stuff with um, different infinities and uh, yeah. like really weird types of sets. So he was probably thinking or talking with other people who were interested in these kind of... Yeah, it says, things. through consideration of the set, Cantor and others helped lay the foundation of modern point set theory. Most common construction oh, is the Cantor ternary set, 
I'm just curious why it's named after him and not Smith. Which I'm sure there's an interesting backstory to that. So it sounds like he popularized it but didn't discover it, which I guess yeah. has its own merits. I mean, the, there is something to be said about, like, someone writes about something but then they, they're not actively advertising it or not building it a part of the, the wider schema of mathematics. You yeah. know, does it really exist if only you know about it? <laughs> so, and Cantor did a lot of really important work in the early 20th century, so it's kind of, I feel like it's fair, but, you know, <laughs> uh, if if Stefan wants to disagree with me, then you know, he can meet me at my house. Maybe. Yeah. But, but or, or I, I imagine he's not going to be showing up anytime or, soon. Or Huggy Beer was right. Math is just a popularity contest. Uh, yeah. To some degree, it kind of is. Oh, Huggy Beer, you missed out. We we decided earlier the best math movie ever is uh, Mean Girls, so you might be right. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is a popularity contest. I mean, so. math is a, like, a central thematic focus in the movie, so I more to be said about that than goodwill hunting <laughs> my junior high math teacher made us watch stand and deliver multiple stand times stand and deliver <laughs> is such a good pedagogical <laughs> math movie <laughs> it's part of your curriculum <laughs> I, if i could okay like if i could put that on like my like a future like math course and i was like if i got to make the syllabus with like no oversight i would be like you are all required to watch stand and deliver it's like an important cultural moment. <laughs> oh, Huggy Beer, Alex agrees with you, so congratulations. All right, if you guys have questions about fractals or math education or want to discuss anything math-related, uh, we're happy to do so. We should put a prediction up, because it has been a while, Let's and I completely do... failed. I mean, we got to this... do this one before the, the night ends. Which yeah. It's too funny. Which, this one or the... the oh, yeah. Backing. All right, so we're going to go with this one first yeah keep reminding me those of you guys in chat that are sticking around remind me to do predictions because i make my guests do all this work to come up with predictions and then i use about half of them so i am the worst um but anyway yeah if you guys aren't following us click the follow button uh use your standard internet units we're going to spend them on a prediction right now click the predict button at the top of your screen the theme of the night is what came first a mathematical innovation or some major historical event usually related to i don't know political social something in individual upheavals uh but in this case the question is which came first newton's calculus or the english civil war which occurred in 1642 which one came first newton's calculus which he used or invented to solve physics problems, um, or the English Civil War, which happened in 1642. Which of those two came first? So this, I, I definitely liked this one because it sort of frames like what was happening culturally at a time when Newton was alive. <laughs> Isolated and, in a yeah. room, as <laughs> slightly a lunatic. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if people know this, but there was a a pandemic happening when he was at university and they closed the university and so he went back home and that was when he invented calculus <laughs> so I did not know. all of you who did not invent calculus over the pandemic uh covid pandemic uh shame on you you could have used your time more wisely man i'm i'm curious if anyone did anything of value during COVID. well pandemic. that's what the bulk of my dissertation work was done. There. <laughs> I was like, I don't really have a whole lot else to do, so might as well. Oh, man. That is fun. All right, you guys have about 30 seconds left. Do your predictions now. Which came first, Newton's calculus or the English Civil War? Uh, Huggy Beer, we will get back to that question because there are some fun things with zeros. Actually, one of our earlier predictions uh, was related to zero. So if you guys have any guesses, Newton's calculus or English Civil War in 1642, which of those occurred first? And also, if you didn't invent calculus during COVID, you are a failure to society. That's what we just learned. Man, that's brutal. A very different time and age. <laughs> it's like, you know, back in like the 1600s, 1700s, it's like, you know, if you weren't inventing some like revolutionary new theory in your spare time, it's like, well, okay, there was your shot. <laughs> I mean, but the, the 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 contrast is either you were super rich or you were like a, a peasant, right? And yeah. Like Newton had staff and personnel and people going out. So, and, like, I think one of the funniest stories is that like Euler is like doing like groundbreaking revolutionary work, and then like 
the Tsar of Russia, I think, wanted him to come to Russia and, like, prove God existed. So it's like, well, this guy's going to pay me money to live for several years, so I'll, <laughs> go, I'll go do it and, like, write some BS down and then we'll call that a proof. Yeah. But it's like, you know, he gets bothered by his, his Tsar to, like, like, do my, like, pet project where you use science to back my personal whims. Like, okay. <laughs> Whatever. Well, if you're paying me. All right, Alex, what is the answer? Which came first? The Newton's calculus? The answer is the English Civil War, but not by much. Uh, I think it was like 20 years or something. Uh, or maybe just under it. Yeah, so the the English Civil War, I think it, we, we pegged the year that it ended in 1642, although there were later conflicts sort of stemming from that later on. Uh, but... Newton was sort of towards the back end of the 17th century. And now it's, it's it's interesting. You were particular in framing this as Newton's calculus because yeah. there were like Leibniz and yeah. And like, I, I mean, I I just wanted to pick Newton just because like Newton has a date and yeah. I, I kind of wanted it to be English history. But like <laughs> I feel like it should be joint credit because mm -hmm. they they sort of independently came up with it. And it's not like they came up with all the ideas completely by themselves, because there was some notion of like infinitesimals among the Greeks, even. Mm -hmm. so, like the Greeks kind of knew about like how to approximate certain shapes, which is sort of what you're doing with an integral uh, by what they called the method, the method of exhaustion, I think is what it's termed, <laughs> where they, they said like, awesome. we, we got really close to estimating it. So that's what we're calling it. Yeah. So to them, that was as good as what you know you could do back in the day but it took until newton to sort of like come up with the infinitesimals and like a slightly more rigorous uh framework for modern calculus yeah <laughs> so back to the huggy beers question did we all need to invent our own calculus i was out when that was assigned okay I mean, so as a makeup assignment you don't have to invent calculus um you just need to invent a modern framework that is not logically inconsistent for all of math. So <laughs> I all. expect that on my desk by the end of the day on yeah. Friday. Uh, so good luck to you. Yeah. Good good will be upset, but yeah, no, solve that. I like crazy. Which is still an ongoing issue, I, I think, to some degree. Yeah. Although I, I try to stay very far away from the logicians who... who, who Try to convince everyone that, like, this new hot thing, this is the thing that we need to base our framework off of. <laughs> and the flavor of the month, and it just falls by the wayside. All right, Huggy Beer had a question. Do you have any fun facts about or, or mysteries with zero? I'll start with one. The symbol for zero actually came after the Great Sphinx. So Great Sphinx was 2500 BCE. The first symbol for zero, also by the Egyptians, was 1770 BC. That was the first symbolic use of zero. So that was a, a prediction we did earlier. Any additional interesting? Uh, so uh, I, I, originally, when I first wanted to write that question, I wanted to do the pyramids of Giza, but I knew the pyramids were sort of ancient. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, everyone's going to know that the pyramids are older. So I went with Sphinx, because I thought the Sphinx was rather young. But it turns out the Sphinx, I think, is also maybe older than the pyramids. <laughs> the pyramids I, yeah. So I, I could not believe that. So I thought that would be a bit more of a stumper, which I forgot what the split ended up being. Oh. It was pretty close on that one, I think. It might have been a 50-50, actually. Huggy <laughs> Bear's reply to his homework, uh, or their homework. But to those that don't understand my logic, it's going to look like a crude drawing of a hippopotamus. Oh, that's okay. You just need to come up with the rules, and then we'll evaluate if they're logically <laughs> within, consistent. Within the framework of hippopotamus dimension math, it'll work out. All right, let's see if... Oh, wait. Let's kill this guy first. Let's see if I can get the skull. I don't... Oh, wow. You remember the skull? This was the, the only skull I could ever get, because it's just right over here. Yeah. And there you go. I'll need to try to remember uh, because this one's blind. Oh, wow. I. Oh, wait. What? Do I have skulls off? I thought this was blind. The like, one that turns off your HUD? Yeah. Um, do we have skulls so off? Those of you that aren't familiar, uh, uh, skulls in oh. Halo 2. Uh, it's, it's... Yeah, we have skulls off. Oops. Okay. Oh, well. I think that was on the, well, the initial. I'm pretty sure this one was blind. So you, you came over here. And did I miss the grenades? Yeah, well, I'm already full, so whatever. 
So there, you'd pick up a skull and it would activate a either buff or debuff to you. I think most of them were debuffs. They either helped the enemy or they hampered you. It was sort of like a challenge to try and like beat the game or beat the level with the current skull enabled. And then afterwards, you could go from the menu and like turn all the skulls on. I was going to say, most of them are, they hamper your gameplay, but there's one that makes you invisible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. there was a fairly recent channel challenge called, it was the Lasso Challenge, right? Yeah. Legendary All Skulls On. Except for one, which made yeah. you invisible. <laughs> so yeah. they made it particularly hard, but you had to do Legendary Deathless Halo 2, and it took 25 years, something yeah. like that. Or, uh, let's see, Halo 2 came out like 2002 or 3, I think, or no, 4. It came out Yeah, okay, 04. 20 years. So, yeah, I think it was like just under 20 years it took them to, to finish the challenge. And it was because it was it was uh, critical, right? Yeah, that, critical. that did the $10,000, uh, whoever beats this first gets yeah. 10 I mean, grand. like, pe people were probably trying it for a while, but yeah. critical kind of, like, brought it to the main front. And I, that's kind of, like, how it is with, I think, a lot of academia, where it's like, if someone, like, advertises, like, here's a big problem, I will pay you $10,000 to solve this problem. You get a lot <laughs> of attention solved. real yeah. quick. No, this this happens in the, the, the in like chemistry a lot. Is is somebody some company will say we need to know how to do this, submit proposals and or show us how to do this, and it's worth this dollar amount. And so like real, tangible, I don't know, real life achievements. Yeah. So my work kind of falls on. There's a less famous list of so everyone or most people probably have heard of the Millennium problems, the math problems where if you solve it, you get a million dollars. And one of them has been solved so far. Um, the rest, I don't know if there's any hope to actually solve them. Um, there's another list of problems that one of them is sort of related to what I do called Sma Smale's problems, Steve Smale, S-M-A-L-E. Um, one of them is on the packing and covering problem on the sphere. And if there's a g general algorithm for solving that, and as of right now, it's unsolved, and I don't know if there's any hope to being able to solve it. Maybe so, but that's kind of the general area I'm working in. So it kind of helps to have like a famous person sort of advertise, say, hey, here's a, here's a bunch of problems I think are important. And then you get a chance to solve them, and that becomes a really big deal. Okay, I for I think buggers are supposed to come in. Yep. I don't know how many times I've played this level. During that trip to the bathroom, I decided I want to be rich enough to define problems that people have to solve. <laughs> just like, here's an intriguing idea. Which is like, I feel like every, billionaires just need to like realize that academia is like the best way to get your name on something. And like, people will remember it for like decades and decades and decades. Like, we still, I mean, the some people consider the Millennium Problems to really just be an extension of Hilbert's problems. So. Hilbert was a mathematician. We're still talking about him a hundred years from now. Yeah. If a billionaire just you don't you and that's the best thing is that you probably don't have to pay out because yeah. like, who's actually going to solve these <laughs> math solve problems? Yeah. So just get a billionaire and say like, listen, if you put up like ten thousand dollars for this problem set and just call them, you know, like Musk's problems. Yeah. People will try to solve them, and then even if they don't. They'll still be called Musk's problem set or Bezos' problem set. Yeah, or you make an institute named after you that's trying to solve the problem and hire the best in the world. Like yeah. Craig Venter with the Human Genome Project, he's the only name I know from that. <laughs> Despite being hundreds of scientists working over decades, he's the one. <laughs> like that's that's the way to become immortal. Has nothing to do with you know how much how many yachts you own, like come up with a model, come up with something and name it after yourself. I mean, like Vanderbilt kind of had the right idea. Mm -hmm. So there's Vanderbilt University. Yep. And Beckman and yeah, Stanford. Yes. So fund academia because people will, will never like if you if you have a funded professorship, you better believe everyone's going to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's on every I'm in the Jeff business card. I'm a prof I'm the Jeff Bezos professor of mathematics at such and such university. Like, yeah. They're going to have to mention that on their CV at every single conference. 
Man, the the what is the Mud family? Sealy G Mud. They're like yeah. every major university has a Mud building, <laughs> yeah. and that name is immortal because of it. So yeah, sure you could buy an extra yacht, but I apologize to all the, the Halo nuts that I am not doing BXR, but <laughs> oh man, yeah, Halo One was my game. Like Halo it, 2 was more my game. I did play Halo 1, but... Um, Anyone I that loves it. Halo 2 hates Halo 1. Or, or like, I love Halo 1 for what it is. Like, yeah. the story, the campaign is amazing. The The multiplayer, less so, but, I mean, I think the multiplayer was sort of more of an afterthought for them, whereas Halo 2, they definitely, yeah, from the yeah. ground up, knew, like, well, multiplayer that, will be, like, a huge factor in this game yeah because that was the first xbox live like yeah cross plat like it, they really dove in deep on that because halo one we had to do either a, a hard network, network connection yeah. or there was the something land. called xbox connect where yeah, you could actually yeah. use a website but like you you can imagine lag now bring that back to 2001 it was terrible Uh, with those types of problems, you need to go in with the idea that there is an answer, though. No, you I, is don't. that true? No, That's, you don't. That is not true. Absolutely. Look, the Millennium problems, I don't think those are going to be solved in this... I, there's probably going to be at least one of the Millennium problems that will not be solved this Millennium. And yet they're still <laughs> called the Millennium problems. See, in math, it's okay to have a question that will never be answered. And people will generally just still try to do it because even if you don't prove the the ultimate question, if you have a really good idea that stems from trying to solve it, then that's still a really good idea. Like I don't know how many like good ideas it took to finally solve uh, Fermat's last theorem, mm -hmm. but I mean like Andrew Wiles I think has been on record of saying like I don't think I should get the credit for solving it all by myself because he basically. Uh, did like extend he thinks that he just extended the work of other people and i mean if you want to simplify it that is sort of what he did but i think his leap was sufficient yeah, i think his leap was sufficient that he earned all the awards he earned because he did the work it wasn't trivial it took a long time but it took also a lot of incremental steps to work towards that ultimate answer yeah is that generally accepted in the community he's just humble uh I would say most people probably agree with him. I'm, maybe like the upper, super upper echelon people maybe believe like, no, everyone should get their fair share because no one ever remembers the other guys. I mean, it's the same thing with the Nobel Prize, right? It's like you get three <laughs> and it wasn't three. It was dozens, if not Which, hundreds. That's the, that's the thing that I think is really good about the Fields Medal is that they're not constrained to how many people get oh, the award. really? That's as far as I'm, but they do they do try to keep it like you know as small as they can because it's like it really should be like transformative or like some like huge result that's like unbelievable like all, all that all that should factor together and it should like overall like work towards like the broader interests of the math community so i didn't know this so fields medal that's every four years yeah it's every four years and you have to be under 40. Which, under 40 yeah that's almost cruel at this point well there are other awards that are not age restricted and i do think it is important that there is an award that is age restricted because yeah. it does motivate like the young mathematicians like if you think you've got a really good idea then go out and pursue it because you might win a fields medal like yeah but usually those junior awards are to like not have the old guys win it constantly but in this case but, it is literally the yeah, biggest award in mathematics right? yeah i mean you can call it that just because it's sort of the most well known i'd say like the only other contender for like the biggest math prize would be the the a bell prize and that is sort of more like a career award i, like, see. I think everyone lifetime who's, achievement everyone who's won that is like mega old <laughs> like fifth I, I don't know if anyone under 50 has won it at okay. like so like generally it's like people did something huge and then like at maybe a decade later they're like they won the the a bell award for everything they did in this area so that's more of the career award and i kind of like it to stay that way where you have the career award for the people who did decades of work mm -hmm. they're at the the end of their career they're kind of like at the point where they get to like oversee the young mathematicians and encourage them to pursue mm -hmm. good ideas and not just steal everything for themselves 
I mean, but what's the concern then? If you open up the Fields Medal to any age, it'll um, favor old people or like... I mean, it'll... maybe, but I, th I think it's more of just the motivation of like know knowing ahead of time that I could still win the Fields Medal. I'm probably not, but like knowing that I could win the Fields Medal is sort of like motivation to the people who think that they have a really good idea, but know that it might not pan out in five years, in ten yeah. years, but like if there was a chance you know I, I should go ahead and do it and it sort of encourages the community to look at what the younger people are doing and sort of like actively engage in the development of our younger mathematicians i can see that changing the lens of the senior people i i, I don't necessarily believe that that this metal existing for junior people is going to change who's pursuing those problems right like yeah. Because, I mean, it's one of those things I heard as as a, a going on the tenure track is like, if your goal is to get tenure, you're doing it wrong, right? Yeah. Your goal is to do the science and tenure will be a byproduct of that. Yeah. And so presumably the Fields Medal pursuit is a byproduct of just genuine passion. Yeah. Like you said, right? You weren't going to be a pharmacist, right? But, yeah, but also like promoting the community to like look towards those younger people. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That makes don't sense. just look at the old heads who have already proven that they can come up with good ideas like look to the people who are fresh faced coming up with something new coming up with something innovative and like really critically evaluate if what they're doing is like moving math forward in a positive sense which i think is like uh, overall a great thing and more of a benefit than a detriment yeah that makes sense all right we should do another prediction i'm going to do this one because okay. i think that one's pretty yeah. fun we'll save your your other one for last how about that Oh god. We'll close the night with it. Let's see if I can do my standard trick of just park it right in here. And <laughs> just shoot. Just, just wait. <laughs> You're not doing speedrun strats? No, I'm You saw the summoning salt run. video. I did see the summoning salt. <laughs> yeah. How hard can it be? Oh. oh too many characters. Oh no, lost my shotgun, man. just gun it as fast as we can try to get to the end wow i have too many characters for this answer unfortunately Ooh. all right we'll get rid of that um, we'll just let him know it's it's alex the great <laughs> we're gonna call it here all right ladies and gentlemen if you're not following click the follow button in your standard internet units click that predict button right now um, we're going to do a prediction. The question is, what came first, negative numbers or Alex T. Great, also known as Alexander the Great, dies, which happened in 327 BCE. So which one came first? Did we have negative numbers or did did Alex the Great die knowing negative numbers existed? <laughs> well, that's not necessarily a fair comparison, depending on what part of the globe negative numbers existed. But the question is, were negative numbers known before 327 BCE, or did Alexander the Great die before that innovation occurred? Negative numbers. Yeah, another fun question. Also, anyone joining us, we are two and a half hours in uh, Ask a Scientist Gaming, Mediocre Gameplay, Expert Science. We've had a journey through several several games this evening. We've gone from uh, Super Smash Brothers Melee on uh, GameCube to Fire Emblem on Game Boy Advance to, what else do we do? Halo, Halo 2. Halo 2 on, on X. We're playing on Xbox One, but that came out for the 360, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. Uh, Original Xbox. The, yeah, uh, Halo original, 2 original. Original yeah. Halo 2 is original Xbox. So we're doing Halo 2 Anniversary on the Master Chief Collection. But I've stuff. got the graphics set to old. Oh, you did? I yeah, didn't know that. Very polygonal. <laughs> oh. I think it's this one. Yeah. Which oh, looks very pretty, but them. I love the charm of the... <laughs> the original. Like, just how like, much it stands out. Yeah, I mean, you like geometry and fractals. Uh, nice yeah. seeing... <laughs> seeing shapes all right so you got your phd you've, you've done a lot of math education if you could educate the world on one thing if you had a microphone that everyone could hear and you could just clarify something about math what would it be um my mic drop moment would be math is interesting for its own sake it need to be applied and then mic drop I that's think it that's like my pet peeve is the the constant need for people to justify math as a utility to do stuff that they think is more interesting when i think math is on its face interesting 
I mean, and this is a, a problem across all STEM fields, right? It's like, yeah. can I study something just for the sake of learning more about it? But do I have to justify my existence to a congressperson and a taxpayer? And the answer is you have to balance the two, right? Yeah. Like, wh where does your guys' funding typically come from? Um, largely NSF. Um, the, I get, the nice thing about uh, math is that it is very, very, very cheap. Yeah, uh, no, that's true. The, I, it's personnel. So, personally speaking, the biggest expenses for me as a theorist are travel. So, the the best way to get work done is to talk to other mathematicians and to talk to them about math and get good ideas because, you know, science, math, it's a social exercise. You have to talk to other people. You have to talk to them and understand what their ideas are, like spitball concepts off of them and like see what they think about certain things. So ultimately that's like the way that you get new math is to talk to people and to get new ideas from them. Mm. So going to conferences, uh, meeting new people, uh, networking, all that kind of good stuff is sort of pivotal. And then I guess the, the expensive thing is hosting a conference, which yeah. we hosted, my advisor hosted a conference last summer. Uh, the IC, uh, what is it? I, I forgot the acronym. Uh, CBMS maybe is what the, the shortened version was. Mm -hmm. um, we had a conference on uh, a lot of people who just kind of work in related areas to the geometric measure theory so we had some people who do work more on the pdes but the application of geometric measure theory to solve certain uh pde problems with uh like weird domains where you have to solve them on some like fractal like domain so yeah you you kind of have to talk to people mm -hmm. Well, that makes sense. All right, what came first, Alex? Negative numbers or Alex the Great dies? Negative numbers. And it is feasibly possible, although I don't know if there's any historical evidence, that he might have seen these negative numbers because... Oh, the Chinese documentation. From the Chinese documentation, there uh -huh. was a, like a, a famous Chinese text from like the second century BCE uh, onward that like really developed although it's known that it was written by multiple authors so it's possible that he might have encountered that chinese text in his conquest of asia and read about negative numbers hmm. although then the factoid associated with sort of interesting that on excel and other like tabular programs when you keep track of finances black is considered positive and red is considered negative so when in you say, red. I'm in the red, I'm yeah. in debt. And in the Chinese rod system, they used it the opposite way. Red was positive, black was negative. Huh. Which, And I don't know if that like influenced Excel. <laughs> but that would be extremely funny if that were the case. It was that, somehow related. Like, they saw that, but then they were like, you know what, it should be the other way around. I very much doubt anyone had historical insights but when like, they're making okay. spreadsheets. So black, <laughs> black sort of makes sense because there's black ink, but then why the choice of red? Is yeah. red just the next most available ink choice? Because I feel like it probably devolved from that as most digital things do, where there was the analog version first, and then the digital version just is copying what the analog version already is. Like, the keyboard is basically just an electronic typewriter. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I will probably look that up later where in the black came from. So, yeah, congratulations if you said negative numbers came before Alexander the Great died or Alexander the Great existed. Because <laughs> it was... Yeah, because it was even before he was born. 200 BCE. Yeah. So, yeah, that that's intriguing, using color coding for positive and negative. And then again, the, the, there was a bunch of follow-ups after that. The Babylonians had negatives, but no zero, which is intriguing. So yeah, congratulations to anyone that answered that. All right, we're approaching 10.40. Uh, so we said, what, 20 minutes for an arc? Is that what we're going to give yeah, you? Yes, so I think once I've made sure that... I think, do I have to get in the tunnel, or is I, it have to go I, through? I, I think I have to go through remember. the tunnel, so we'll just go in. We will not trick the ghost. Oh, we will trick the ghost. Oh, no, my passenger will kill the ghost. <laughs> so I do gross. remember there was like a pivotal step of the speed run. You have to like trick the ghost to like come in here. 
Oh, and then you and can then steal you, it. You can steal the ghost, and you just ride through the rest of the level, killing everything. So I, 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 I was into speed running for Halo One before that was a thing, just because like you couldn't network all the time, so you play the game as fast as you can. But Halo Two, I did not. Always loved just annihilating the grunts and seeing them fly. <laughs> Yeah, there was a particular jump off a cliff that you can do in Halo 1 where you can fly down and get to a, a, a spawn point where there's no other bad guys the rest of the level. And it was just, it was a pretty boring speed run at that point, but yeah, fun trick nonetheless. All right, we All right. can swap to... All right, you're ready for this? For Narc. So, Alex is a longtime viewer of the stream, so Narc is not new to you. But anyone not familiar with the stream, Ask Scientist Gaming, we start we close every night making my guest play a bargain bin game for the Nintendo Entertainment System called Narc. And effectively, we are going to win the war on drugs. Playing a 1986 NES version of this game. Let me get the call the timer up we force every one of our guests not only play this game but also play it with the timer because they're going to be keep competing against all their colleagues at florida state university and elsewhere um and so if you're ready alex let's do this okay were you excited that you were going to play nar because i was i was like should i practice i don't know but we'll, see. we'll <laughs> go in raw all right. all right so go ahead and start Three, well two, i'll start oh, the time it's when you touch the ground okay But yeah, if you guys have any questions, you have about 20 minutes of Alex, and he's an expert in, in fractals and math, and he's taught a lot of different math classes. So if you guys have any questions, uh, throw those in chat. I don't know if that's bullets or... That's bullets, but you have infinite, so oh, speed okay, run, nice. speed strats. <laughs> you are walking right. There is no advantage in killing anyone. Um, you just want to go as fast as you can. I figure, you know, like, holding down shoot will at least... Maybe stop me from getting stun locked. Uh, yeah, if you get shot by bullets, every seven bullets costs you a second. So, depending on how much you want to optimize this. Can we start a trend where we dare guests to play Narc? Huggy Beer, you win the dad joke of the night. Congratulations. <laughs> we will dare guests to play Narc. All right. Um, going back to Huggy Beer's comments. Yeah, my hippopotamus yeah. calculus is going to work for one of them. Uh, the Millennial Prizes, absolutely. I have no I mean, question on that. It's, you just got to shore it up, you know? <laughs> exactly. As solid a chance as anyone else, I guess. <laughs> your, your optimism on those problems is shining through. I mean, one of them was solved, so... And I think... If you if you asked a bunch of people... Oh, I've already got yeah, it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get the key card, yep. Uh, if you asked people before Perlman solved the first Millennium problem, what's the first one to get solved? I don't think people would have put their money on the... Uh, What's the name of it? The problem you solved, the Poincaré conjecture. Uh huh. Um, which is funnier? I feel like it's 69 because I feel like that comes up more often than 420. Like 420 <laughs> is just like it's too big, so like you kind of need it. Like if I think of the prime factorization of 420, that's what. Uh, so divide by uh, five would be. Uh, 84 uh, and then 84 is um, divided by 2 would be 42 so I can divide by 2 again so I have 2 squared I have a 5 and then it's 21 so 3 and 7 so 2 squared 3 5 7 so that's like you know a bunch of primes needed so you, you kind of need like a bunch of numbers for that to happen but 69 that's what uh, 23 times uh, three. Oh, there you go. Blue card. Yeah. That was a quick drop. Yeah. So speed strat. So I think 420 just doesn't come up as often. So you don't get to laugh at it as much where <laughs> as 69 just, it might like coincidentally come up. So 69 is funnier. Definitively. But wouldn't the 420 joke be funnier because it's told less often? I guess if it, like if it did come up, <laughs> I don't think I, I, I think I might have like had the idea of like, what if I made one of my integral problems on Calc three be four twenty sixty nine? But it was, <laughs> it, it it would have been too difficult to like get the numbers to work out properly. Like the setup to the problem would have been too ugly. So I was like, I, I won't it's force my students it. to do this, even though like I I guarantee half of them would be like, wait, is this really right? Do I just jump? There we go. <laughs> I think it's like at the bottom is the way I need to go. Yep, Oops. and then bombs. You, you don't have a choice. There's unless you're memorizing. 
next time practice the speed okay. run uh, cuddle puppy thank you for joining us as always coming in and strong with the 69 versus 420 <laughs> which alex has spent some time thinking about while teaching classes so worthwhile uh in chemistry the one i have to deal with is uh when you have chemical reactions and you have species a and b sometimes you color spheres right you have a red sphere you have a blue sphere but sometimes you call them blue balls and that gets a good laugh out of the audience so <laughs> we all have to deal with our ticks and whatnot uh, I think the rule of comedy is threes, though. So 69 has more threes. It has a three and a 23, but 420 also has a three. <laughs> so not more threes in the sense of exactly three, but yeah. more three digits. Yeah, it has more single digits that can be factored by three. Man, I like it. All right, which one didn't we ask that we need to? Um, we need to ask about the, the sphere packing. Oh, the, the that's packing recent. Question. Yes. yes. So, the most recent batch of Fields medalists, one of them is related to what I work in, and uh, her name is Maria Vyaskovska, I think is the, the last name. Uh, and she proved that the op she proved what the configuration is for the optimal sphere packing in Dimension 8. Now, the betting question is, when I've looked this up. It happened in 2016. So both things happened in 2016. So now you have to decide which came first. <laughs> which major milestone came first? Sphere packing in Dimension 8, which won a Fields Medal, or Harambe is killed, which happened in 2016. So they happened in the same year. The question is which happened first? And when you're talking about sphere packing, that's when it was published, right? Yes, this was when it was on archive. And I think uh, there was articles being written about the result. So I like, see. So it, like was, it was gaining it was notoriety at that time. Mm -hmm. So the question is, which one happened for sphere packing in Dimension 8 or Harambe is killed? <laughs> Major milestones in all of our lives. Fields Medal. How much is the Fields Medal worth? Uh... Eternal glory? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Just pride. I, I don't remember if there's a monetary award attached to it. All right, so you're going to stay on the bottom during this. Does, does it count as cheating? If this you've seen this whole, like, the diff... I, they, I feel like this should have been Super Nintendo because, like, doing the different button presses yep. like for different frame amounts to get different results is just that's the weird part <laughs> it's true and it challenges everyone all right you guys have about 15 minutes left if you have questions math related alex is happy to answer them um one of the questions i'm going to go with that i like to ask regularly is what's the like flat earth anti-vax equivalent in your so, field i did think about this a lot from your other people and surprisingly there are people who go against consensus math results um they're not super like they're not like as widely published because you know it's hard to like get a bunch of people to last one. it's hard to convince a bunch of people that you've discovered the right math formula uh -huh. and everyone else is wrong whereas like there's something i guess inherently sexy about like no flat earth is true and sphere earth is wrong yeah so there are people who believe they've found answers oh. to oh did i go in the yep no okay. so you got to go to the end again and don't press up after you go through the door oh got trapped yep there are people who believe they've solved these like famously unsolvable problems so you're gonna go left silver oh, key card door yeah. yep so, so the card there's a couple of famous geometry related problems that were like widely known to be difficult since the greeks but we have since developed new techniques to show that it's actually impossible huh. so one of them is called trisecting an angle so given an arbitrary angle so an angle of any length can you with a compass and a straight edge divide it into three equal s smaller angles you gotta shoot the rambo guy with bullets Yep. Sorry. I guess I'll just do this. So trisecting an angle. I apologize. So can you trisect an angle? So they Turns have to out be, it, yeah. it is impossible to trisect an angle, but because it's sort of like famous, like a famously hard problem, people there are people that we call cranks who like say like, no, I I have the proof that you can trisect an angle if you do this, and it's like it's like I don't know how to tell you this, but it's been proven that it's impossible. 
but they proved it without geometry, which is maybe that's the, the point of contention is that like we had to use completely different go. techniques to show that these problems are impossible. So there's another one that's a sort of famous, which is, um, I don't know if this has many cranks, is that we have quadratic formulas. There's a cubic formula. There's even a quartic formula, but there is no quintic formula. <laughs> so there is no general formula for solving a fifth degree polynomial. Mm. So depend, like if it's a special fifth degree polynomial, you might be able to solve it. But given a general fifth degree polynomial, you, there's really like no hope that you're going to solve it. And it turns out like it's it's related to group theory reasons why it's impossible. So like we had to develop a completely new machinery before we even realized that actually this is impossible. Hmm. All right. So so in terms of cranks, like when you talk about flat earthers, it's it's people that might have like a mental problem right where uh, they're like like, like it, maybe i i i sh i don't want to like say that it, it there's like a mental problem but yeah like, there's like some like maybe like narcissistic belief or like or like a or dogmatic like, position like dogmatic position that yeah. like i know that i'm right because yeah. i i have this logical argument and yeah. It's hard to accept that you're wrong. Like, I mean, that's kind yeah. of generally true of like, it's hard to accept that you're wrong about something. I see. Especially like these, some of these cranks will spend like years developing something and they believe like, no, I've spent like 10 years working on this. It, it has, has to, to be, be right. right. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's like a it, sunk cost. Yes. Yeah, so it's like, I've, I've spent all this time, but it's like, uh, you have these. Cranks. Oh, I already have it yep. now. Okay. Nice. I mean, so some of those cranks, like especially the the flat earthers. I mean, when psychologists look at this, there's a certain degree of they want to feel special, and one way to do that is having like an insight nobody else does, and so the causality behind it is that. So you're not saying they're they're similar. The, the yeah, cranks yeah. in your field have a different cause. Yeah, I, I think it's more of like the glory of proving these like unsolved problems because a lot of them that you see they're not mathematicians formally trained. So there's that sort of like elitism sense of like oh you just don't believe me because you're a professor yeah. and i proved this thing that you couldn't yeah. but it's like no it's actually for math reasons that are like way beyond your head that it actually is impossible like i've i had to go to a graduate course and we spent like an entire week showing why the quintic is unsolvable like it, <laughs> it took an entire week of graduate math course to get to that result so like it's a very famous result but it it it's not easy so, but, but that's an absolute truth. That but it, is, it, that's, it's an absolute truth, and it's set in stone. It is impossible to get a quintic formula hmm. in that sense. So <laughs> Huggy Bear asks, mathematically, if you start with a 90-degree angle, just make three 30-degree angles? <laughs> so yes, the, the trisecting the angle problem says, if I give you any angle and I get to pick the degrees, can you divide it by three? Mm -hmm. And turns out you can't. You can divide it by two. So if I gave you a two degree angle with just a compass, straight edge, and a pencil, you can divide it into two one degree angles with p perfect accuracy, at least perfect within drawing. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's not guesswork, it's not eyeballing it, it is, it is actually perfect. There's a way to do it. There's um, a really interesting phone game, and I think it might be an iPhone app or an iPad app that teaches you geometric constructions via like puzzles hmm. so you can learn about like greek geometry and that's so this one you're going to kill it. wheelchair guy yep so you'll have to hit him with rockets when he comes out on there you oh, go and it's uh mr big your long-awaited arch nemesis <laughs> oh. all right Tuttle Puppy, not a question, but I think a workout program for math nerds is you have to recite the first hundred digits of pi and do one push-up for every digit you get wrong. The most impressive dude in the lab would be the skinniest one. <laughs> Tuttle Puppy, thank you as always for joining us and dropping the trolls. Uh, fun factoid, if you want to accurately... If you want to accurately uh, calculate the diameter of the universe within one atom accuracy, you only need like 40 digits of pi. Yeah. So, like, you don't really need, like, NASA uses, what, 10 or something like that? Like, yeah. It just, at some point, it's not useful anymore. Oh, so look it, at that, nice shot. So it is, like, it's kind of amazing, like, the degree of accuracy you can get with estimation by truncating, like, like, you think, okay, the universe is so big, but you don't need that many digits to get really, really accurate. 
And that's kind of one of the things I like to talk about <laughs> in Calc 2 when I teach like Taylor series, which is the bane of every calculus student, mm -hmm. which is that the moral of the Taylor series is that you can get really accurate results. Ah, that's oh cool. man. He knows what he needs to do. Now it's just execution, ladies and gentlemen. Cuddy pu Cuddle Puppy, so what you're saying, Ken, is you do 60 plus push ups every time. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Believe it or not, I still do push-ups in my lab. I have a slight workout regime because that's the only time I'm going to work out, but it is unrelated to pie calculations or pie recitations. How far can you go on pie? Is that a... Uh, I, at one point in high school, I think I had up to like 200 digits. Wow. But that was like, I, I used to have to ride the bus every day. Yeah. So like every day for like a month, I studied, like I had a piece of paper that had the digits of pie on it and I got... Four bonus points on a test. <laughs> so <laughs> totally worth it. Totally worth it. And I got a hundred on the test anyway, I'm pretty sure. So it's like kinda didn't matter. What but is I could go three point one four one nine five. It's three point one four one five nine two six five three five eight nine seven nine three two three eight four six two six four three three eight three two seven nine five and I think that's where I taper off. <laughs> <laughs> Cuddle puppy you double checking that because we also put Oh there we go. Glasses are off. All right. Now it's glasses to the face. I'm at sub 15. I don't know if I'll be able to hang on to sub 15. Uh, no, it's pretty tough. The next level is at least 15 seconds, the civil forfeiture level. So maybe so I, I can still hope for sub 16. I still need to hit the hat again, right? <laughs> Just make Dr. White do 80 push ups and Ken can do 95. <laughs> Sounds good. We'll do that off stream right after this. I suppose I can. I don't know if you've seen, if you're on Discord and you've seen our updated uh, performance. So the best way to do this is go to the top of the screen. Yeah, I'm trying to get the timing down right. Well, so you don't have to jump shoot anymore. Oh, you got oh, the glasses okay. off. Now it's, yeah, but if you're at the top of the screen, he can't hit you with whatever he's shooting. Let's try to go left and... Yeah. Get some this, distance. This timing on the A press is the rockets. Yeah, is yeah. Way like but, tighter than I thought. But if it's any consolation, these are your last two rockets. So get a good distance away, top of the screen. Turn back. Yeah, uh -huh. you're really close. You're like A framing. Go. There we go. Now it's just bullets. So no more rockets. Now it's just holding bullets and run away. And you can't shoot them at the top. You got to be somewhere at the center there. All right, last minute for questions. I think Alex is going to have this beat sometime in the next two minutes, we'll say. Hopefully be sub-16 or 17 now. Somewhere within two two minutes or so. Um, if anyone has suggestions on someone we should raid, and Alex, you you watch Twitch, so if you have any suggestions as well. we'll I we'll, don't know who's live right now, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look see. after we go uh, not live. Um, offline, go to the screen. We'll see who's... I can't even tell if I'm hitting this vertebrae. Yeah, so on the downswing, you want to shoot them. Like, yeah, there. Because it's... Yep, those are the ones you're trying to hit. <laughs> so, yeah. Now you, now you appreciate the frustration yeah. that every single guest feels, because... It does look easier than it, it is, it doesn't it? It feels like this really should have been a Super Nintendo game. Yeah. yeah I got like two in a row. I mean, the so GameCube cool. version is pretty good. So if you ever want to run the Dolphin emulator, that's it's it's much prettier game than this one. Hey, this needs a dodge roll. So is there any standard canned questions I should have asked you that I didn't? Um... I guess unlimited budget, no moral qualms. So I kinda yeah, don't I don't have it, like but... a good experiment, but yeah. I guess if I wanted to like revamp math education, yep. like this goes more in the moral camp. I would probably, and okay, now hear me out. I would kidnap a bunch of kids and put them <laughs> in a rigorous math training program. Yeah. And we would just teach them like fundamental math at the expense of all other subjects. <laughs> like I just out of like what curiosity, happens. like yeah. I'm, I'm interested to in know like, Okay, so if we got to like completely surround kids with just mathematics. So you want to get them when the downswing is when the bullets you want hitting towards them. You just want to see what happens with those kids. Yeah, just I mean, I mean maybe they'll be super good mathematicians or maybe I, not. Maybe they'd hate it, but. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the experiment with mathletes because that's what they do, right? We, I mean, like there's, there's the calculation side, but like, can we teach grade schoolers proof math? 
And I feel like maybe there's like some something that you could maybe do with that, but maybe not. Yeah. No, that's fair. Unlimited budget. You can make the uh, because the it, white not center of math Because learning. otherwise, if I had unlimited budget, I would just put a bunch of bounties on quite, like open math questions. I mean, that's and just say like I'm I'm putting two billion dollars out for the Riemann hypothesis and yeah. get every person in the world learning math just to get two billion dollars. I mean, what's crazy is some economist or some venture capitalist would do the math. Like, how many? graduate students can I pay per hour yeah. how long will it take like that's that's intriguing <laughs> they, they can't put a sentence together but they can figure out the surface area of my hippopotamus got it <laughs> those would be yeah. some some Choose maldeveloped words. children that's for sure <laughs> all right there you go down to three And you got the you got the hard jump first, and then this guy's just giving you a hard. There you go. There you go. I think it's right. I'm I'm spreading out too much with how I hit him. There we go. All right, go right. All right, dang it! That <sighs> took a lot longer than I thought with the vertebrae. So now watch the speed run tutorial. So close. Practice. Yeah. <laughs> Join me on the leaderboard. Submit your time. Cuddle puppy, I'm still waiting for your time. Okay, I'll skip gold in the sake of time. Yep. Metroid has saved the animals. I will have saved the gold, but I won't save the gold. I'll just. Oh, there it is. 1958, yes. under 20 minutes. Congratulations. Just you, in time. You won the war on drugs. You beat Narc, which, as a longtime viewer, that has to be somewhat satisfying at the very least. <laughs> so. My first Narc defeat. Or first Narc time. You can do your we'll A L E, I guess. Yeah. Oh, no, it's. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A no, it's analog inputs. E. Congratulations. Contact your DEA <laughs> agent or whatever the hell. I'll let him know. I, I defeated the the war on drugs. <sighs> All right. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us. Alex, thank you. This has been a long time coming. Alex tried to find a faculty member who would do it. We said, all right, let's wait until you have your PhD. So as of a month ago, congratulations, Alex. You are officially Dr. White. Um, and we're glad you could join us on our stream. The first mathematician to join us. Uh, it's been awesome having you. Any parting words for the audience? I will direct this to the other faculty of FSU math. It's now your turn. I want you on the Ask a Scientist stream. Send this to your advisor. Show them that 1958 yeah, time I'll and like. Say like, all right, you're the advisor. You have to beat 1958. Yeah, yeah. You I'll have to send it to our one of our chairs. And be like, all right, you're the chair. It's your chair responsibility. You have to show up. I mean, and also you got to put some kind of bounty on it because yeah. mathematicians love bounty-based prizes. So <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> let's do it. So Alex, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's, it's been a journey. I've, I've, I've really appreciated our conversation tonight. Um, thank you all for joining us. Hopefully you had a good Wednesday night. Um, joining us in two weeks is Dr. Paul Renfro. And so Paul Renfro is actually a historian, will be the first historian on stream. He studies post-1945 U.S. politics, uh, gender, sex sexuality published a book recently about moral panic in particular the 1980s and 90s where everyone was trying to kidnap your kids and how that was not necessarily based in reality and so yeah we're looking forward to having paul on stream in two weeks and so join us we may have a surprise stream next week because i have a colleague visiting from um, drake university if he says yes next wednesday we'll also have stream but guaranteed uh, on the 21st we're going to have yes yeah, satanic panic absolutely so paul ren and fro will be able to talk about those moral um panics and what feeds into those and how those manifest and things like that so um thank you guys as always for joining us it's always a pleasure we really enjoy our time at ask a scientist gaming alex thank you again um yeah until next time